Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Games Explained. I am Bridger, this is episode number two of our Stellaris exploration here, and with me again, the knocking in the background, Mr. Mark Hanna, welcome. Uh, hi, thanks a lot Bridger, looking forward to it again. All right, so last we left off, we had uh, taken a bit of an exploration tour around the solar system, as well as, of course, the interface that we see here. We've gotten through quite a few of these, gone over how the research works, etc. And now we're going to continue on with that and go over the last pieces of, uh, of the game, hopefully, in this particular walkthrough. Uh, so we had just been planning on uh, attempting to, I believe, expand to Alpha Centauri, if I remember correctly. Um, now again, just as a recap, if you're looking for worlds you can expand into, if you see one that is a little tinge of color in the top, that means that you know it's there, but you haven't yet, uh, yet scanned that particular planet in the system. So you see the system is gray, and if we go into the system itself by holding, or by clicking on E, you can see that the planet itself has not yet been scanned by our science ship. It will be soon. Green means it's above, I believe, uh, 80% or higher, uh, habitability. Anything between, I think, 50 and 60% is yellow, and then below that is going to wind up being red. Again, if you want to get a more detailed view of the map, you hold down the Alt key, and it will show you a lot more detail, including, for example, over in Alpha Centauri, there's an anomaly that we chose to wait, and also on Bernard Star, there's an anomaly we chose not to examine yet, because we're waiting for our science ship to get to a higher level. So did you say Alt E? Is that right? I'm sorry, just Alt. Will holding down Alt is the modifier that shows you all this information. So you can see it also shows that we know okay. about these potentially habitable worlds over here, but it, the the interface hides those from you by default because it doesn't matter. You can't do anything with them yet. Later mm -hmm. on, when you can terraform things or when your habitability goes up, if your habitability goes up to where they you can uh, inhabit them, they will just pop in as green to you instead. So they'll just pop onto the main interface. But until then, the game hides it. You can turn that interface on permanently if you hit the Details Map Mode checkbox in the bottom corner here. Uh, that's that's certainly an option. I actually like playing with the Details Map Mode off, and I'll just hold Alt to see, for example, my ship uh, sensor ranges and things like that. Uh, the other I thing see. that's hidden there, again, is the... Uh, the mining stations that you've already built. Okay, so at this point, we have just enough to build a colony ship. And there's two ways that we could actually launch that colony ship. You can click on this planet here, uh, or you can also go to it by zooming in, finding the planet, clicking on it, and there you go. Um, and you can see, we can look at this here, and we go to Planet Summary, and there's the Colonize button. Mm -hmm. A slightly more useful way, sometimes, is to go to the Expansion Planner, also the F9 button, if you go up to this window here. This shows you all of the habitable planets that you have found so far. In this mm. case, it has the minimum habit habitability set at 40%. You can drop this all the way down to zero, and it shows you uh, actually the same amount of planets because it doesn't know anything about the other planets that we found. But anyway, so you can say, okay, show me only the ones that are surveyed, and now it'll show you all the ones that are surveyed, and now only show the planets that we can currently colonize is pretty valuable, because sometimes you've surveyed a bunch of planets, they just happen to be in enemy territory, so it's not something you can colonize. So, mm. you can click on this planet, and it shows you the planet, very useful. It also tells you, by the way, in this window, the native values on the tiles of the planet. In this case, this one has a lot of minerals, which is very nice. And it's also a size 18. Bigger planets are great because you can put more, more pops on them to generate more resources. The further away a planet is from your territory, the higher the influence cost to colonize that planet. So it always costs 350 minerals to build a colony ship, but to colonize a mm. specific planet will sometimes cost more resources. Now, we're about to choose the actual place on the planet we want to put down our sort of capital. If you recall, and we look at Earth on the surface view, the capital of Earth, represented by this planetary administration building, has a special ability. It has an adjacency effect. Mineral food and energy that is adjacent to this uh, orthogonally will produce an extra plus one. So the food here is producing an extra plus one, the minerals here, the food here, and the power here. So. Uh -huh. To that end, when we go to colonize Alpha Centauri, we need to pick a spot that has adjacency in all four directions of food, minerals, or power, ideally, or nothing, because we can always build a food, mineral powers on those tiles. The problem, of course, is if you 
choose down here, well now you've only got three possible orthogonal things, and it turns out two of them are science, which doesn't get boosted by the planetary administration. So oh. looking at it with this in mind, I see only one tile here that is going to give us the maximal benefit from our capital. And that's this one right here. Okay, what about the mineral one? I know that there's those uh, red areas that you'd have to mm -hmm. clean up. So the other thing is guess, that the planetary administration yeah. only produces energy and unity. So it will cover oh. up and not produce, it won't stack with the mineral on the tile. I forgot to mention that oh, piece. That's, that's the most right. important piece. Okay. So you have to put it on either a blank tile or an energy tile in order to get the most effectiveness. I gotcha. It Thanks. used to be the planetary administration produced food and minerals, which made it a little easier to place. But now it's only energy. Uh, so, or maybe it was f food and energy. I don't remember. But uh, they changed the most recent patch. So let's put it right here. And now we get to name it. What do you want to name our new colony? Uh, uh, how about Marcos? M-A-R-C-O-S. Yes. Boom. All right. You're like Alexander the Great. You get to a new town <laughs> yes. and a new area. That will be Alexandria. <laughs> exactly. But we don't, don't we already have one of those? No, that's a different region. This is Alexandria in Egypt. And then we're going to make another one over there in, in, uh, in near Baghdad. All right. So uh, that is plugging along. You can see now that Earth has a spaceship construction going on. It's building a colony ship. That's what the little guy, little guy with the flag is. Now... As soon as we get enough minerals, we could use our construction ship to start building more of these uh, mining platforms in our main solar system. Jupiter has a nice four energy credits. Again, these are all randomized every every game. Here's our uh, little Mark, Mark's Marauders ships here. We could try to explore a little bit about what's going on here. We know that there's a thousand ship alien vessels hostile over in this area. We know that there's stronger ships here as well. Looks like all three of our scientists that are doing research all leveled up right there. They're all now level two. They're running a oh, small skill two. boost. Okay. Yeah. What were we researching here? We were researching a physics lab, growth time, that's good for colony settlement, and then a mineral processing plant. I don't know if we talked about this one, but this is not like the normal mining network. This is a planet unique. You can only put one mineral processing planet uh, plant per planet, and it acts kind of like a regular mining network one in that it produces two minerals, but it also boosts the total output of all minerals for the planet by 10%. So you want to put it uh -huh. on any planet that's producing a decent amount of minerals. It has a slightly higher maintenance cost than a regular mining network one. Um, and I've never found a reason to build mining silos. Oh, now they've changed it. It has an adjacency effect of mineral output one. Maybe it would right. be valuable uh, in a very specific circumstance. In the past, it used okay. to just be, I believe, just mineral storage capacity. But I almost never reach my mineral storage capacity. Um, I was wondering basis. about that. 6,000. It's amazing. Yeah, so. And as now, you... what is the... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, it says Arium Nebula down in the corner here. Is there some special effect of nebulae? No, I think it just randomly generates names for various parts of the galaxy. Okay. Okay, okay. As far as I know. Um, the other thing is, you can see, just by researching this, we've increased our mineral storage capacity by 1,000. We'll research more and more of these, so it'll continue to go up past 6,000. Another leader mm -hmm. has gained a level. That would be our scientist on the UNS Lagrange, who's doing all the... Oh, we've finished uh, exploring. Ooh, that's a huge planet. What is that, a 22 on over here on Sirius. Wow. And uh, that has a great many number of spaces, and we could put a nice colony spot right here because it means that uh -huh. all four adjacent areas would benefit from the adjacency eventually, once we clear out the blockers. Uh, it's, that's a okay. great big planet. If you look at Sol, I think it's a 16. Yeah, your home planet's usually a 16. Uh, and then we get an 18 here on Alpha Centauri, and we have a 22 on Sirius. Now, we could also take a look at this ocean world eventually, although it is quite far away. And while huh. these are about, what, 50, 50-ish to colonize, that one will probably be more uh, 80, 80 to 100 because it's so far away. We might want to try and grab it, though. It, did, it didn't say else. it was that far. 53, also 53 to the, colonize. Sirius and Alpha Centauri are both the 53s. Ah. System okay. survey complete. All right, so our science ship is done there. Where do you... 
what do you want to explore with it next? We could go and try to survey this planet and maybe get a big outpost over here, get a jump on the exploration or expansion part of the game. Um, or we could try and uh, uh, sort of scan the other planets around our area and look for anomalies and things like that. Well, it seems like growth is important, and if that could be a potential nice growth sector over there that you've mentioned, maybe we should try that. Uh, we can also research these uh, these level two anomalies with a much lower risk than uh, before. I think they were at twenty percent before. Now they're at ten percent. Do you want to continue waiting on that, or do you want to go and take the shot? Do we have any such anomalies in Sol, or are they all in Bernard there, Star? There's one in Bernard Star, and there's one in Alpha Centauri. Oh, I don't know. I like the idea of taking that ten percent uh, risk. Yeah. All right. So let's we try it. Research there, and then again, I'll, I'll hold down Shift, and then okay. I'll right click on this star and choose Research to give him a cue, and then I'll hold down Shift and say Survey this system next. I see. Right. Okay. So we give the the science ship a little set of uh, cues there. Now we're again at a, at a at an impasse. Do we save up for another colony ship? Or do we build uh, some mining stations here in Seoul? It's worth pointing out that when the colony ship is built, it's going to drain our credits by eight. Oh, uh, it is. As long as it's around and until the colony has gotten itself up to self-sustainability. Don't we have some kind of objective to build research stations? But these are not research these stations. Are the mining these are stations. mining stations. Yep, stations. correct. So we uh, don't have any research stations in this area to build. But you're right, yes, we have an orbital station uh, mandate. Yeah, we can't build... Oh, we can build here if you want. This will have a research station over in Bernard Star. Does it? Yep, it would give us uh, engineering research. Uh, I think we ought to do that to meet that objective, but uh, uh, that's not going to inhibit us to go ahead and build those Jupiter mining... Nope, nope, we'll do that first, and then we'll go to build the mining stations as well. It looks like our physics right. research is just completed. Uh, we just finished getting the physics lab, so we'll take a look at that uh, and what we can do there next. But we now have a couple of choices. Mm. The fusion reactor will allow us to expand the uh, shields and weapon capabilities of our ships in the future. Because all components that you add to a ship cost power. And if the reactors you put on your ships are more powerful, you can have more slots for shields and, and better shields and things like that. We can also get an administrative AI, which increases our research speed for the rest of the game by 5%, which is pretty nice. And we can also get a power plant too, which would help alleviate a power issue as we expand. All three of these are good. I leave the choice to you. Well, uh, I like that fusion room power thing. It looks like it has some interesting... All right. Out outcomes, so why not? Okay. We'll take that one. Now, uh, where's the level of these scientists shown? I don't see her level anywhere. Two stars it... down in the bottom left corner here. You see the oh, two there star people yeah. there? And if you hover over, it tells you what those skill does for these scientists. Their research speed has been boosted by 2% per star. Um, and if we look at the leaders tab from here... Construction complete. Oh, oh, spaceport on Earth has finished its construction queue. And as soon as it did... Oh we started getting less energy credits. Although, here we are, the Lagrange is expla examining that uh, anomaly. We've triggered some kind of cascading power failure in the ancient shipyard orbiting it. It blew up in a spectacular explosion. Oh, so that 10% risk did come back to bite us there. Did it uh, blow up our own ship? It did not, that? it did not, uh, oh, luckily okay. for us. It, we didn't get the catastrophic, like, critical fail. We just got a regular fail on the roll there. So, uh, uh, hopefully... Not very good. Uh, does she have a penalty for bad performance on this? Uh, no, no. Uh, no. no. Hopefully she'll, she'll learn some, something from that. She is uh, adaptable. Uh, okay, so, as you can see now, we hit negative balance because uh, our colony ship completed. Okay, uh, and there it negative, is. Because uh, we had a drain. Yeah, negative, negative on balance? energy. You see, if you look here, um, ship main is at minus 10. Eight of that is just because of the colony ship that we built. And here it is flying over. And once, while well, the colony is uh, is in the process of a warp wind down, that's the disadvantage of the warp system that we have. We can go anywhere we want with it over a particular distance, but it takes a while to wind up and wind down from warp. You have to kind of recover the engines after they make a jump. Hmm. So here's our science ship coming in to do an analysis of this 
uh, debris field here, if I recall correctly. Okay. And now let's see what happens. We can actually watch the process of these, this colony ship sending the drop ships down to the planet. Oh, okay. This okay. time it looks good. There are clear evidence that a massive space battle took place in close orbit to Alpha Centauri 2A at some point in the last 5,000 years. The surface on one side of the moon is pockmarked with craters. Though these wrecked ships are all signs of a very poor condition, the fact are all in very poor condition. The fact that anything remains at all uh, must sustain a testament of advanced design. Science officer is preparing an expedition to sift through these derelict hulls for any valuable technologies. So, if we look at this, we get a special project from this anomaly. Mount mm -hmm. Graveyard Expedition. So, and then that arose because we built the colony? Or? No, that arose because of the anomaly that she was researching. Oh, that was the anomaly, that's right. Yeah, now the colony ship is working on doing its thing as well. A lot of stuff is happening at the same time here. Right, I see. And the research station has been constructed at the same time. All right, we finished getting the growth time bonus. So now we get a new, another set of options for our society research. So, okay. this Pitharian dust refining will reveal this Pitharian dust, which is a strategic resource, which is found mm. uh, usually on tiles, I believe. And that's one option. That could be on one of our planets, and we just don't know it yet. Uh, planetary unification will increase our monthly influence by one, which can be very valuable once we start spending it as a monthly maintenance on things like uh, frontier outposts and edicts. And then orbital hydroponics farms can be a way to give a boost to your food output because it allows you, remember, modules that you unlock are things that go on a space station, the space port, rather, that's orbiting your planets. So this would allow you to put a little module on your space port that provides an extra three food. I usually only pick this if I feel like I'm in a desperate situation in an early game where I need extra food output, because usually you can build enough hydroponics farms on your planets to where it's not an issue. So I would recommend something between these two. What do you think? This resource, by the uh, way, increases your food output by 10%. Food output. The, uh, are you talking about uh, plan, uh, the dust refining? Does yeah, that, this, or? This, is, this increases oh, the food it. output yeah. of, I think, everything in the, the entire empire's food output by 10%, if I'm not mistaken. Well, that looks like a better choice than the hydroponics orbital. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I, I say that rather than politics. Okay. We do, you do eventually want to get planetary unification. But I, okay. it can totally be skipped a little bit in the early game, for sure. Okay, so that wasn't a premature decision. Okay. No, I think that's fine. That's why I said you could take either without a major issue. Uh, Colonizing planet. Yeah, so now you can see, again, it shows it's costing us eight energy while the planet is still growing. We still have to su support the planet until it can sustain itself. Uh, so that is what uh, we're waiting on. And right now, there's no pops to move around or anything like that. We can't build a spaceport. We just have to wait until it finishes. It's going to take approximately two years uh, to do that. And you can see it's got a little border that's started to grow around it. And as it finishes its colonization, it will grow. The borders themselves will continue to expand based on the number of pops that we have in our uh, empire. And there are other technologies that you can get that'll also increase that. And here's our uh, construction ship. We can have it come back here and build those mining stations so that we don't have a problem with energy credits. I was going to say, is that the only way, energy. really, to improve the energy credits is to have additional mines or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's either that or you go to the surface of your planet and you uh, set that up to, to build things as well. Uh, so we could, for example, uh, clear the sprawling sl slums here and uh, so that way when a new person is... Uh, born on the planet that could go to here. Meanwhile, you can see if you hover over this blue bar, it shows that because we're producing plus four food, we're getting an extra 20% per month on growth for our empire at the moment. Um, that, that normally grows at one, so the fact that it's growing at plus 1.2 indicates that you get a 20% boost. And uh, that, it, it doesn't show, unfortunately, like when this when the time is going to be done. You just kind of have to estimate. It's like, oh, 1.2, hmm. and there's approximately 24 left, so maybe two years-ish, maybe a little less because it's a 1.2. Um, so we do, however, want this guy to have a nice building, and the only options we really have now are Mining Network 1. Um, I don't remember. Are we waiting? Yes. Mineral processing plan is coming, so we could just wait, and then in 11 okay. months, we could build a mineral processing plant there behind him. 
Okay, that sounds like a good plan. All right. All right. Meanwhile, our science ship is over here exploring this area. And this uh, this planet here has got the ocean world that should have a habitability of about 60% for us. Now, is it any value at this stage or any other stage to have more than one science ship? It seems like they can pretty much cover everything here. Uh, really. There can be a value in having more than one science ship. Uh, I don't think it's necessary right now, but usually when I get up to around medium empire size, I want a second empire, a second ship to help me out. Um, right on the other side, you need two on each side or something. Yeah, okay. as the as the as, as the side. available space around my empire gets bigger, it can be helpful. And now, actually, we've got another research station that we can build over here in Alpha Centauri because that's inside of our borders now. So I've got our construction ship selected. It's currently building a mining station on Neptune, but I'm just going to queue up a research station so that we can kind of get closer to that orbital research mandate that we were attempting to do. That will get us towards uh, towards it by three. Uh, All right. Okay. We've got another tradition available. We went towards prosperity last time, which reduced the cost of our mining stations. Uh, now we can choose between ship cost and building cost reduced by 15%, or it unlocks the private colony ship. This oh. means that you can pay for a ship in energy credits instead of in minerals, which can be oh. valuable because usually in the early game, minerals are very hard to come by. You want to use them to build all these mining stations, but you have to wait and save up 350. That's like three to four mining stations worth. Uh, to, to build a colony. So either one of these is a good option. What do you think? Hmm. Uh, none of these other group traditions can be picked at this time. Right now we we're could, stuck we with could this one, no, right? We could pick another one if we wanted to. Similar to Civ, we could pick another one. Uh, however, if we finish this one, we get, a, we get to choose an Ascension perk uh, for finishing the tree. I see. So it's probably good to stick down to one tree. Also, these ones down here can be pretty valuable at the bottom of the tree. Ship upkeep reduced by 10. Building up keep reduced by 10, and the energy grid and energy nexus also produce two unity. So all of these are good as well. If you were going to pick another one, uh, we also have the option of going towards discovery, which reduces our research station build cost, or expansion, which means new colonies start with one additional point. And the research stations, what do they generate? They, they generate, generate the, the research points, uh, like the physics, uh, re, uh, physics society or engineering research. Oh, right, right, okay. Uh, all right, well, we should pick one of those. Uh, I suppose the one with, I always like the ones with options first, if uh, they're all equivalent. So, Standard uh, we already got, we, we've already got, uh, we don't have that built yet. No, That's these two are, the, are available right now. Oh, yeah, pick that one then, I think. All right, or standard just... construction templates. That lowers the ship cost and building cost of everything, which is, you know, that's also quite good. We're going to be building a lot of buildings on this new planet, and we're still going to okay. be building a lot of buildings on Sol. Okay. All right, we'll speed things up again here. Now, the Alpha Centauri is probably close to finishing here, about one year away. So we could consider starting to save up to build on Sirius uh, mm -hmm. for a new colony there. Uh, it would have been a little foolish to build Sirius and Alpha Centauri at the same time, because then we'd get hit with that minus eight penalty on both of them at the same time, and that would have drained our energy quite quickly. All right, we've just got a new research unlocked. So this is the mineral processing plant. Uh, that's the one that boosts our output. Okay, we've got a new set of options here. This one here would allow us to build Corvette assembly yards. That's this, the smallest craft. The ones that we have access to at the beginning of the game are Corvettes. And Corvette assembly yards allow you to build them cheaper and faster. And this is a module that goes on your spaceport. So you can specialize certain planets to specialize in building certain sized craft, and they will build them better. It'll also give us access to spaceport level 2, which increases the defensive capabilities of the spaceport and increases your naval capacity of the spaceport as well. And this is the building block, the step towards bigger ships. We cannot get access to destroyers until we get improved spaceport. Ion thrusters increase the both the combat and sublight speed of our ship and increases the evade possibility. Uh, and then this is Teldar crystal mining, increases kinetic weapon damage. I don't remember, did we choose missiles? I think we do have missiles. We do have missiles. So kinetic weapon damage, not super valuable at this moment. Well, it seems to me that, uh, 
I like the idea of building more Corvettes. All right. And faster. Improved and unlocking board. bigger ships. That's sort of militaristic. So yeah, we also went with uh, fusion reactor. So that kind of gels with improved spaceport. We can oh. get bigger, better ships that can stick more energy on there, for better shields and things like that. Also, again, remember, see this says mineral storage capacity plus two thousand. So all of the passive mineral storage always gives me plenty of mineral storage to where I don't usually feel the need to build those silos. But I don't know. That's just me. So. Uh, we're now continuing on. We're going to save up our current minerals. Now we'll have a choice. We can go and try to grab this uh, ocean planet. It's not nearly as good as the other one. You can see it's a lot smaller. It's only 13. It's smaller than our mm -hmm. home world. And it doesn't have a fantastic spot to put down our capital anywhere and, here. And those red waste areas mean we can't even do anything about them. Yeah, it would take a lot to expand there. So while it would be good to get a foothold out here... It might not be good as our second planet. Unfortunately, Could we, we put the, an outpost or something out there? We could claim it, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second, because first there's the birth okay. of space piracy. Whoa. As civilian right. travel in space becomes more commonplace, several powerful criminal organizations on Earth have sensed an opportunity to expand their operations. They have convened a number of civilian freighters uh, and converted a number of civilian freighters into improved warships in which they raid civilian shipping lanes for booty. We know they call themselves the Cursed Ones, and that they are operate from some kind of hidden space facility. Every effort must be made to bring these criminals to justice. So, this means we've mm -hmm. got an early uh, faction of humanity that we have to deal with militarily. So, Mark's Marauders, I can tell you right now, with only 89 military power, <laughs> are not going to be good enough. Oh, and we've been kind of uh. slacking here. We should have had them orbiting Earth, because even though they only oh. have a very small... Uh, maintenance cost, still that small maintenance cost would have gone away if they're orbiting a planet with a space station. Or not gone away, it would have been reduced by 25%. So, so we're not going to use them to explore anymore, but to protect against pirates, but we don't have enough. Of yeah, them. we're going to have to build a few more Corvettes. Maybe we wait until this research is done? No, that's 49 months. I don't know if we can wait four years for that. Um, however, you were asking about maybe claiming this space. We can mm -hmm. do that. The construction ship can build something called a Frontier Outpost. So if we choose the construction ship, then we right-click over here. Oh, it looks like we can't build a construction outpost just yet. We need a little oh. bit more minerals. We need 200 minerals. So we'll save up to do that, or we could save up to do a colony ship to Sirius. That's your choice. I would say we do the Sirius thing. Okay, um, we'll do that first, and then we'll do the... the uh, the other one after. I didn't know it was going to be so expensive to build an outpost. Does that cost then move forward if you do build a colony? Does it get uh, sort of subtracted so it's nope. a little cheaper? No, the frontier to build a outpost stays there. But here's the thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see. Hold on a second. Fleet detected. Ah, oh, the right. pirate fleet from the coast. They're already in it. They're, they're already on a direct. It. They're on a direct intercourse intercept course for the solar system. Uh, now they are only 166. So we could build some corvettes to try and do something about this. So let's first we, take a quick look. Do we have look. time to do that? They're on their way. Well, no, no, we're not, no, but we're going to start emergency construction. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Let me see what we've researched so far here. Uh, we didn't really research any, these, this, a bunch of these are starting research, by the way. So we haven't researched any new ship technologies, unfortunately, so we have to go with whatever our basic ship setups are. So when you produce ships, there's a thing called a rally point. And the default rally point is Earth. So when you click on either a fleet or a planet, there's a little icon with a flag here. And you can see if you check it, it's yellow. If you uncheck it, it's bluish, right? You see how it changes color? Yes. Okay. Now these ships have to be built at the space station, I assume. Yes, each so. ship is built at spaceport. I just want to ex explain how spaceport. they get built. So... All right. The ships themselves, when they are built anywhere in your galaxy, will attempt to go to the closest rally point, which is a fleet. If there are no fleets, it will go to the closest rally point, which is a planet. So you can set a bunch of different things to rally points, and then when the ships are built, they'll go to the closest one. In this case, what we want the outcome to be is that when new ships are built, they immediately join Mark's Marauder fleet. So we right. set that as a rally point, and you can see now it's got two rally points. Um, it, now, the order of these doesn't matter. It's going to be the closest fleet, then the closest planet if there aren't any fleets. So now that we've selected that as our, uh, as, as our rally point, we can go to Earth, go to the spaceport, and we can construct, what, three Corvettes? Nope, two Corvettes. Uh, maybe by the time those are done, we can construct a third 
with the minerals that we have building uh, now. If we get lucky, uh, these pirates will come and try to attack the space station, which is 1, 1, 1.2 thousand uh, military power, which would be well, great. See, that's why I was wondering why they would come, but they might just go for Saturn or something. Yeah, like they might that, go right? for our mining stations. Uh, or maybe we don't just really know where they're mission. going. Yeah. Oh, okay. They could, unfortunately, also go uh, over to Alpha Centauri, maybe, and uh, raid a mining station there. They're gone. Where'd okay. they go? They're going up to well, Burned Star. We don't have anything there for them to attack. Oh, no, we do. We have a research station there. Station I forgot. Under uh, so that's that's bad, but we can't do anything about it. We're going to lose that research station almost certainly here. What, what <sighs> value is it of them? Well, it looks like we have missiles at the research station. The research station. station does have a little bit of power, but it's really uh, negligible comparatively. And we can actually click this to look at the battle unfold. And it shows you, hey, they're using mi missiles. Okay, and they're so doing this much damage. Know. And our little station is doing this much damage. And you can see the station is slowly taking damage here. <laughs> and two of their ships seem to have shields. Which is interesting because we don't have shields. So somehow they have out, out to class us on shield technology. <laughs> I don't know how that worked out. <laughs> and soon we can see... Yeah, you would think they'd have the same technology level as us at the most. You right? would think. But apparently not. All right. Maybe that's why they felt confident enough to uh, to break away. What, from what do they get out of it? Of destroying this? Is this just random like the rage against the machine, stuff? man? It's rage. Yeah. So these pirates aren't collecting booty. They're just. <laughs> All right. We have enough to throw. So now another... we've lost our research station. So now we're down to two out of four again. I suppose. I don't know if that actually resets. Let me look. Nope. It's only construction. She's got oh, like, okay. her her backers are like people in the constructors union. <laughs> or yeah, like right. That. Yeah, they don't care if it does anything. <laughs> right. All right, our construction ship right, is currently All right, so does that idle. improve the power of the pirates in some way? Because no, they not necessarily. They're just a big annoyance until you get your, your military, your fleet strong enough to beat them. We're at 149 now. We still aren't going to get any major benefits to our to our upgrade our fleet, so we're just going to have to rely on numbers exclusively. Fleet. Our co our construction ship is running away from the pirate ship, which is what it's supposed to do. Um, so there's the construction ship running for the edge of the system, so it can warp out. Construction complete. Our our colony is almost done here. We could build a spaceport, but that's like 300 minerals, so that's not going to happen. So hopefully uh, our colony... Oh no, the pirates colony ran away. Bravely. Bravely ran away. So our colony has been established, and we can now click on it, and you can see here on the surface... Okay, lots of stuff happening. First, yeah. our colony here is finished, and you can see it started with the one pop in the planetary... Well, what's called the reassembled ship shelter, which can be upgraded later to the planetary uh, assembly building, or whatever it's called. Um, that bar shows you she's only half there. She had, No, that shows her happiness level. Uh, she's at 55% oh, happiness. happiness. Right. Um, so she's at 50% with an additional plus 5, because probably because of the faction she's in. And then you can see right. they are growing an additional pop over here at 1.10, because uh, you have to feed every pop that you get, and we didn't build any extra food production since the last time we checked, so we got an extra pop, so that lowered the amount of food output. So, uh, definitely putting this on a food tile and constructing a hydroponic farm wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. But we'll come back to that when it's relevant, because we're not going to see that pop for quite a while. Instead, we found, uh, we've recovered artifacts from an ancient alien civilization on Tanab 2. If what we have learned hmm. from these artifacts is correct, the civilization was some sort of confederation that consisted of mainly different alien races. They called themselves the First League, and they appear to coexisted in relative peace for two million years, or two million years ago. Though the Teneb system lies in the region of space that seems to have made up the core of their territory, a partial map was found. And uh, so we begin the precursors. There's a bunch of different possible precursor event chains that you can get throughout the game. Uh, I, I remember one is like we found these cybernetic like nano machines that basically try to destroy everything that's organic in the galaxy. And we wow. had to like they, they, they had been around like two million years ago or something and we had to like find out what happened. 
Uh, and so there's a bunch of different cool stories that can unfold as you search for evidence of the precursors. Situation. And those come in via the form of anomalies. So we found another anomaly here. And it looks like uh, this it has a failure risk of 20%. Do we want to take the chance or come back later? I don't know. We bit the bullet on that 10 percenter. We got, did. Uh, I don't know if it's worth a 20 percent risk. I've got a low. I like the odds being a little bit better than that. But right. I don't know. What is your experience with this? We can leave it for now. We can leave it for now. Okay. It doesn't doesn't right. hurt. Um, now, there is one other thing. If you recall, we had that graveyard expedition here on Alpha Centauri 2A. And if we look at the situation log, in the past, sometimes you can just click the research button like this. To, to do space amoeba observation, boom. And now it's gonna just use up our society research, but it's gonna be done in 15 months. However, to mount the graveyard expedition, it requires a scientist that has skill three or higher in orbit around the planet. So I'm going to choose our science ship because we do have a scientist of three higher. This is not like an anomaly. There's no uh, possibility for failure with a research project mm. as far as I know. So right. uh, I'm going to add that to uh, her queue. She's going to be researching a bunch of these things and then come back and... and uh, Actually, you know what? No. I want to add that to the front of her queue. There we go. So now she's going to do that first. Because maybe that ship graveyard, we're going to find something valuable that we can use against these pirates. Who knows? Uh, so going back here, what is this? Investigate privateers. We need to learn more about the mysterious aliens that we've codenamed privateers. So I guess we'll do that after we learn <laughs> about the space amoebas. Meanwhile, just, all right. Mark's marauders are now about strong enough to take on these pirates, but not without taking significant losses. So let's build at least one more corvette to help uh, increase Well, the that. pirates, uh, how much extra strength do you recommend? I mean, we're... They had 166. We're only barely strong enough to, w to beat them right now. So building one more Corvette might be enough. Then we can save up our minerals to try and do uh, more expansive things. Like, for example, Earth has a couple of upgrades that can be made. Uh, and actually, this guy is uh, migrating to Marcos. He's migrating to the new colony, which is interesting. What? Really? Yeah, that's what this little... What, he's uh, got that backpack, the hobo yeah, thing. Yeah, the little hobo honestly. thing means he's migrating. 12 months away, 12 months from now, he's going to migrate over there. So these guys make their own decisions about stuff like this. Yeah. And this tile has no building on it, so we definitely want to build a mining network there. So that if he, or the next pop that's in that tile... At, oh, we've got another one here with no building. We definitely want that, too. Um, so we need another 50 for hydroponics farm. There's just so yeah, much to spend your resources on at this this phase in the it game. It seems like the minerals totally get sucked up by all of this. They do. Oh. They certainly do. Spaceport of Earth has finished its construction queue. So the next time those pirates show up, we can give them what for. Where are they now? They've gone away somewhere to one of these planets that we can't or one of these star systems we can't see, and they've got their own pirate base somewhere out there. Oh, I see. All right, so our science ship is working on uh, that graveyard expedition. And hopefully we'll get some good results from that that can help us. Sometimes maybe the graveyard expedition, they find an old ship that they're able to get running again. Who knows? And let's see. Why don't we go over a few more of these things? I think we went over contacts a little bit, right? We saw you can sort all the different empires here. Um, we right. know about these guys. Let's talk a little bit about diplomacy. I think they popped up right before we ended the last session, if I recall. Yeah, and you said they might be a good ally. Yeah, because they're federation builders, so they're kind of similar to us. They are also egalitarian, and they're spiritualists, whereas I think we're egalitarian um, xenophiles. Mm -hmm. So we go here, we go to communicate with these guys, and we can see that they currently have, this is similar to Europa Universalis 4, their opinion of us is currently plus 34. Now, there's a new contact penalty where they don't know what to think about you, but that goes away at one by two every year, you can see. Um, okay. They also like us because xenophiles, because we're xenophiles, we get a plus 10 to everybody liking us. I see. Um, and uh, we have a, the same authority uh, type. Um, we are, we're democratic, they're democratic. So that also gives us a little plus here. And then... Uh, I think the other thing to know about how all this works, this also shows you the number of planets they have and the number of pops that they have. 
Trust mm. is an important concept in diplomacy in this game. This is different from the Europa Universalis for trust. Trust yeah. will build based on any existing deal between you and that federation, the other the other uh, diplomatic unit, federation, empire, republic, whatever. And if so, and it will decay at minus two point five or two. I'm sorry, yeah, minus point two five. So we could offer them a trade deal, and I think that increases the trust a little bit. Let's see. If we do, let's see if we we'll do a research agreement with us. Now, if you put something on the table and it immediately goes to negative a thousand, they probably won't do it. Um, yeah, we can maybe okay. maybe ask for star charts. He doesn't go to immediately. What if we offer them our star charts? Okay, uh, we usually need to get at least a plus one. They don't care about a sensor link. Maybe we give them uh, some energy credits, a little bit. Just enough. There we go. So we confirm that and see what happens. You have to wait for a response. Okay. There it is. All right, we know a good deal when we see one. The Gibru Accord accepts your terms. Oh, star charts, nice. So we got a little bit of information about what's in their systems. We don't have to scan those and survey them now. And luckily oh, for not us, at all. Oh, okay. none of their systems have habitable worlds for us. They're all Arctic, arid, arid, tundra, arid. So we don't Can have we... to worry about fighting them for any space. They're probably not even going to go after Sirius because it's obviously not part of their homeworld. We can also see their homeworld type here is arid. So I should see. be good I there. See. It's... So um, arid goes with some of the so that some of that stuff goes for them, but not for us. Maybe. Yeah, okay. yeah. So the trust didn't actually go up from that kind of a trade deal. However, the the best way to earn trust with another with another empire is to guarantee their independence. They can't refuse that because it's a one way deal. We're guaranteeing your independence. Um, the next best way would be a non aggression pact. That's the next the next step up the trust ladder. However, they won't do a yep. non-aggression pact with us. It takes you have to get a little bit to build a little trust usually or other b benefits before that happens. And then the final one is a defensive pact and that one has has the highest trust rating. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not the highest because after that you can then build uh, invite them to a federation. Uh, and ah, that, that is okay. the highest form of alliance essentially. A federation is the highest form. Yes. A migration treaty, I believe, also builds trust, but we can't do it yet because we don't have... What about a military pact? Oh, that's the defensive pact. Yep, yep, that's what a defensive pact is. It means if one's attacked, then they're both... It's it's a defensive alliance only. So we'll guarantee their independence just to, to sort of generate, see what this does. So it'll increase trust by 0 0.31 up to a maximum of 50. However, any kind of deals with other alien species always cost you influence per month. Oh, per month. Okay. For all of these kinds of things. And I think up to a federation, which is one per month, if I'm not mistaken. So... Uh, if we do that, you can see now the trust is going up by 0.31 each month because we're guaranteeing their independence. And because we're xenophile, it actually is only a 0.25, but it gets boosted up to 0.31 because we're xenophile. Our trust builds faster. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So as our trust goes up, that will give us up to a plus 50 on their opinion of us. So that's how you build and make them like and make other countries like. You can also give them like gifts and things here to give a temporary boost uh, to like you can just give them a bunch of energy credits and things like that to make them like you. All right. So can you actually get them to declare war on somebody else? I didn't see that option. Of course, there is if, nobody else. So moment. you can't uh, via anything other than federation. If they're in a federation, you can bring a vote to the federation council and say, we want to declare war on these guys for this reason. And the council will then agree or disagree with you and join the war or not. All right. Okay. So here's the special project at the ship graveyard. Uh, ah. The wrecked sh starships on the surface were too badly damaged to recover any useful technologies. However, they were clearly very advanced and we'll continue to, to study them for the foreseeable future, which means that planet now gets plus three engineering research in perpetuity. So we can now build a mining station there and get a bunch of free engineering research, which is good. Okay, I didn't see that, but I assumed that there was flashed information about that. Uh, yeah, when I hovered huh? over it, it said, it said that. Yeah, yeah now it's here. Read all of it, yeah. Okay, Sorry. that's cool. I, that's I go that's too cool. fast sometimes on these things. 
Okay. No, that's all right. I get the you're giving the gist. Uh, I'm sure that I the details I can work on on my own later. It's just like an EU4 when you hover over the button at the bottom, it tells you what the effects of the decision are. In this case, it was only the one decision, and it's like, okay, great. So we get this plus three on Alpha Centauri 3A or whatever it was. Incoming transmission. Incoming transmission. Actually, these guys have offered a defensive pact. Already. Yeah. They like us enough, and they thought it would be beneficial. Maybe they've got an alien uh, faction to the north of them that they're, to the galactic north, that they're afraid of. So uh, do you want to agree or decline? I don't know. I don't know if I want to be sucked into their war right now. We've got pirates here, but on the other hand, in the vast scope of things, as a technical advisor, what would you recommend? I mean, it's probably a good idea to agree in general with these kinds of things. I so. would think it would be good to agree. The only major downside is that we're getting a reduction in our influence, uh, but we're already guaranteeing them, so it wouldn't be that big of a step up. Because it would be okay. them guaranteeing us in addition. We'd get essentially what we were hoping for, which is a, a sort of defensive alliance. Okay, then let's do it. That, that, that's the direction we're headed then. Yeah, agree. All right, so let's do that. And I believe we should see the defensive pact has replaced the the cost. So it actually didn't go up or down. It's exactly where it was. Oh, it did. No. Yep. So we got a defensive pact now. But the defensive pact significantly increases the speed at which we build the trust. And now they have a cordial attitude towards us. And now maybe they'd be willing to do a research agreement. Hostile fleet. Nope. Exactly. Oh, yes, actually. We do research agreement for research agreement. We can give them a, slip them a little bit of energy credits. Uh, and this is easier, by the way, if you hold down Control or Shift, you can spend a hundred at a time. Ah, uh, right. Or ten. Now, the only thing you, this is the only thing that you can give them is energy credits, right? We can also give them monthly energy credits, or monthly minerals, or monthly food. So oh, if we have okay. a big deficit in energy credits, but we have ton of minerals, and they happen to have a lot of energy credits, we could say, okay, what if you give us ten energy credits, and we'll give you fifty minerals per month? Uh, et you can tell that because that's glowing gold over there. That that's what they would like to give. Actually, uh, no. I'm, that's just the that that doesn't mean anything except that's what one of the parties has selected, really. Okay. Okay. I can't choose this because we're giving them some. We can't have them give us us back. It wouldn't make any sense. So I like to try and get these research agreement deals as lo as as long as possible. Uh, and there we go. So forty energy credits will will make it happen. And research agreements. Uh, will give 20, minus 25% research cost for technologies that we have researched that they haven't. Meanwhile, we'll get a minus 25 cost for technologies that they have researched that we haven't researched. And this is showing us four physics things, one society and two engineering. So we would get, you know, uh, possible up to seven at the moment bonuses to research. Uh. Uh, and over the course of time, huh. as they research things that we don't have and we research things they don't have, that continues to help us both. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. All right. So certainly, it's certainly worth a few uh, energy credits. And a few, and, and a monthly influence cost of 0.75 because you know what? So um, now, oh, 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 we have oh, the pirates oh, oh, have come oh, oh. back. They came back from uh, Procyon. Procyon. So maybe that's, so is that their base? That could be mm. their base. So let's send Mark's Marauders after him. I'm going to build one more spaceship since we have the the, the time. Uh, and But first, uh, it'll join Mark's Marauders as soon as it's built. But in the process, let's... let's how, how long does it take to build? You would think that we'd have 60 to days, spend some... 60 days. But they're trapped 60 here 60 days to bit. build a spaceship. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. It, they're not So they're by not that, that, they will they won't even be there in time for me. It might be. Build. It might be. They just... See, these guys just started moving in this, and the Corvette is already about half built. Wow. Okay. But we're going to get a small advantage here because the research station that's around Alpha Centauri A here, that's doing the physics research, has a it's little bit of a power. It's going to do a little bit to help us. Uh, so our marauders are on the way. By the way, you right-click on the banner and it uh, and it attacks. Like if you click here uh, on the try to click on the ships, it's not going to work really well. But if you click on the banner, it's guaranteed to click okay. on them. Sometimes it's hard to click on the ships. Okay, right. Oh, we finished the other special project about the space amoebas. The nickname now lovingly popularized on Earth are solitary animals and when left to their own devices. All but the youngest specimens are accompanied by quasi-independent organisms dubbed flagella, <laughs> seemingly spawned by the amoeba and programmed through liquid RNA-laced secretions to do the bidding of the host. Wow. Initially assumed to be young space amoebas, the flagella do not seem to factor into any reproductive me me mechanics. Each individual flagellum 
instead operating solely as a disconnected limb for the host amoeba. These flagella are capable of manipulating and blah, blah, blah. They are potential military applications for the graceful pattern of circulation apparent in the flagella's movement. Mm. Cosmic ray catalyst modifier added, giving the following effects. Energy credits plus 5% for the rest of the game. We get plus 5% production on our energy credits. That's Just because we researched those amoebas. Yeah, we found right. some, some practical applications for their effects of, of them existing. Okay, here comes our fleet our warping fleet? to the rescue. It. There it is. It's warped in. Okay. Uh, I was warping in, of course. Meanwhile, uh, the, the extra Corvette just finished, and it's also moving as fast as it can. Okay, oh, you so know what? We forgot, to, we forgot to give them an admiral. We should definitely do that. So if you click on a ship, you can see who's leading the ship. Science ships are always led by scientists, but fleets are led by admirals. Admirals. So you click right, on that. Let's get a nice one. If we had admirals, right. we would be able to choose it. We don't have any, so we have to recruit a new one. So these are all one-star admirals, as they normally are when you recruit them. Fire rate of plus 8% because he's aggressive, or cautious, oh. weapon range plus 10, or trickster, combat speed plus 20, and emergency FTL damage minus 50. So one of the things that you can do is if your ships are in combat and it looks like they're going to lose and you want to avoid losing the whole fleet, you can emergency FTL jump to get them out of combat. There is a chance that you will lose some of the ships along the way, and your ships will then be sort of stuck in, in warp space for a while. They won't immediately come back. So wow. the trickster is able to get out of combat taking less damage and less losses in ships. But uh, we probably won't need that right now because we're not going up against a superior foe. So do you want bonus weapon range or bonus fire rate? Well, given that we have missiles, weapon range is our main advantage, so adding more advantage to that makes sense. All right. Boom. We got him. Okay. So we can launch earlier. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to save the research station. We might get there in time. Usually when we show up, the pirates will stop attacking the research station because they'll see us as the bigger threat. They seem to still want to take it out. Oh! Oh! Oh, they're still shooting at it, and they got it before we got in range. But we got we got a lot more missiles coming. Oh, we got anti missile missiles. Neat. Uh, I don't think we have anti missile missiles, but we did take out one oh. of them. Another one's being focused down right now, and it's gone. Oh. We might oh, kill okay. them without we're... taking any losses. Oh, we were hitting their ships. Okay. Yes. Now I understand. We don't have any control over this battle. No, 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 no. Other than the only thing we can do is hit this FTL retreat button if we wanted to. But much like Europa Universalis. Yep. Do we have uh, statistics of the ships or anything like that? Like the morale rating or armor? Yeah, we can look at that. We can look at that. Uh, I wanted to wait until we started building ships to see how all that worked. Okay, um, we can wait until that later. That's we, fine. But building fine. ships is useless if we don't get any new technology because they've already... Well... It's not useless. But anyway, so, so we lost so two Corvettes, uh, and they lost Julio four. Aguera? Oh, that's the pirate freak guy. Okay. Yeah, that's the pirate uh, captain, but he's dead because we he killed lost, him. He lost all of his ships, so he he's did. dead. So this lost. shows all okay. of our statistics here. It says that the massive amount of damage we did was obviously from explosive weapons because that's all that's on our ships. But we might also put energy or kinetic weapons on our ships or point defense or strike craft. And this says that 100% of our weapons hit. And that's because they're missiles. Wow. Missiles have a very, very high tracking. They hit almost all the time, unless the enemy has point defense. Ah, right. Uh, whereas Which lasers, did not have. Right, right, lasers and kinetic weapons have a lower tracking, meaning they can miss sometimes. Um, and this would show whether uh, uh, the our ships were successfully able to evade enemy fire or not, based on their evasion. The smallest ships, usually their defense is faced, focused on evasion. As you get bigger, they focus more on the extra armor and uh, shields that you can put on them. All right. So, we can send these ships back to Earth for repairs. Uh, because you can see that they're... We lost two ships. We did. We lost happened? two ships. Um, so, okay. it wasn't... That's not uh, too bad. No. Um, not too bad. One of them is going to be replaced by this one that I had built at the outset of the battle. It didn't quite make it there, unfortunately. But it's still on its way to join Mark's Marauders because, remember, we said the rally point is Mark's Marauders. So it's going to join Mark's Marauders wherever it goes. I'm going to send Mark's Marauders back to Earth because when it's orbiting around a planet with a spaceport, they're going to get repaired. Otherwise, they will not get repaired. Otherwise, they will not get repaired. Exactly. So... 
Uh, let's unpause it there and see. So you could so, that, that's the battle st fleet statistics. That's great. And then after so, we repair, we might want to go mm -hmm. check out Procyon and see if that's where the enemy base in fact is. Okay, so this game is like EU4 in the sense that when you have a leader, you can instantaneously, in most cases, assign them to a fleet. Right, unless they're in a battle. Them. Yeah, right. you can do that. Right, because that's one thing you can do in that game is transport uh, uh, leaders across the world for with no time span. Okay. All right, so I'm building another hydroponics farm here. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I'm going to go to Marcos because our guy did, in fact travel over here he's got a bonus happiness because he does he wanted to go here he came here and we allowed it so he's happy um and i'm okay, actually good. uh going to build a hydroponic farm here mm -hmm. it will cover up the plus one mineral but there's no other place to build a hydroponic farm by itself so this is going to be the most efficient then i'm going to bring him over here so that he will increase our food output to help our growth a little bit here because we're falling a little ah. bit behind and the guy on earth who's farming is also leaving for Marcos. So, uh, yeah, we got to deal with wow, that. Wow, they really want to get out of there. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with Earth. It's the capital. <laughs> okay. Why don't you want to be in the capital? Um, All right, so uh, one moment. Can we ask uh, for a quick break here? Sure, absolutely. So we just won our first major, well, major, quote-unquote, victory against the pirates here. Now there's another thing to note. When you win or lose a battle... There's a special project left over where you oh. can go and examine the, the, the what was left, the debris of the ships from the enemy. So we can actually take our science ship and we can send them here. And I'm holding uh, control and shift to put that at the front of their queue because this control special... shift at the front. Yep. That's right. This has a limited lifespan. That's a pretty long lifespan. It's a 1,600 days. But... Uh, I still want to get over here and do this first, because if I remember correctly, they had shields, and it would be nice to learn a little bit about those shields. Yeah, so that'd that, be good uh, if we could. It looks like they have uh, small, small deflectors. deflectors yep. Something. So, uh -huh. the thing about, spe about research gathered from space debris from a battle is that when you get some of it they will always show up as an option on your research tree. They will perpetually stay there. They huh. will not go away after uh, you choose a new thing. The card will be consistently available until you research it. Oh, that's nice. It okay. is. It's quite nice. So, so we're going to do that as a uh, put the queue on hold and put that in the first place of the queue. Yeah, I'm, that's why research. I sent the science ship here, so that'll give us more options the next time we have research options. Maybe we can get shields. So the fleet has been fully repaired. So now we can send it after the potential pirate base over here. We can actually just try to examine what's going on in all of these sectors and see if the pirates are anywhere in this area. Uh, so okay. let's do that. Meanwhile, we're saving up minerals. Uh, we could go after Sirius, as was original plan to build a colony there a while ago, but we got sidetracked by building a fleet, as is always the case, right? I thought it was 350, though. It is. That's why I'm saying we could save up right now to do that. Yeah, I think we should, yeah. Communications oh. established with, oh, Curator Sigma Enclave. They appear to have successfully translated our language. So a encla oh. an enclave is not a traditional empire like, like a player, like a non-player AI faction. An enclave is one of three types. It is either a curator enclave, which is about knowledge. It is an artist enclave, which is about sort of culture and unity and things. Or it is a trader enclave, which will let you trade uh, credits for minerals and vice versa. At a harsh two-for-one penalty, I should point out. But sometimes it's worth it. Okay. Uh, and these enclaves are essentially just singular space stations that are neutral, and they will treat everybody the same. So, the Curator Enclave, he says, Our ancient order was established eons ago by the various galactic powers of ascendancy at the time. We were dedicated towards the preservation of all knowledge. This kind of sounds like the Foundation Trilogy, if you have uh, read Asimov. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, the Foundation. <laughs> only without okay, the... Okay, well, it doesn't look like human to me. But, yeah, uh... only without the psycho history, right? All right. Uh, in an effort to safeguard the galaxy from descending into yet another dark age, uh, we failed. Uh, but a few of us remain today, but we are no less committed to our cause. So uh, we can actually see where they are. If we go back to our contacts thing, you can see here's the curator enclave that we met. And we can click on this little button here to go to 
Yeah. Um, okay. okay so there they? they are. They're, they're orbiting a black hole. <laughs> there, here's their little space station. Here. Oh, is that normal? So they basically have a space station. That's yeah. It. It, that's all they have is a space station. Um, Can that be destroyed if you ever wanted to? It looks like it could. Ten thousand is not a lot once you get to the mid game. I don't know what benefit you would have from destroying them, but I haven't tried it yet. So we'll leave that as a mystery for people to figure out on their own, whether it's a good or bad thing. But Well, wouldn't it leave debris? I guess. I don't know. Yeah, maybe you get a bunch of te special technologies from studying their space station. Who knows? So what you can get from them, however, is you can purchase star charts from them. Uh, now, we don't have nearly enough credits to do so, uh, but uh, we could okay. also ask them to aid in our research. They will give us plus 15% on all three of our science outputs for 10 years for 1,000 energy credits. That's a pretty good deal. We don't have the money for it. Yeah, that. it sounds pretty good. They could also tell us about the mysteries of the universe. If we found a mystery of the universe, we could ask them directly here. But we could also say, hey, tell us something we don't know. They'll point us towards a star system that has a mysterious thing for us to investigate. Uh, oh, for nice. 300 credits. So okay. that is what they can do for us at the moment. We can also recruit one of their scientists, but we can only do that after we raise their opinion, which is we do by using these other services we just described. And one of their okay. scientists is like plus 15% research, uh, or no, maybe it's plus 25% research um, as a scientist here. So you would actually replace one of your scientists with one of theirs. And that would stack with their other plus 15% benefit. So they're all about the science. Anyway, our uh, science ship, there we go, is currently uh, checking out the debris from the battle. And we're going to get a little uh, info dump about what it found here in a second. It's at 57%, you can see. And if you hover over these orders, it shows it's got all these other orders on the, on the table after that. To go find, go forth and find new anomalies. Okay, great. And here it the is. So you can see we are 10% towards the progress of getting deflectors and nanocomposite materials and afterburners. And then in addition to that, we just got a bonus 20% physics and engineering research. Wow, that's so pretty good. The next time that we go and do a research, we'll be able to specifically choose something from one of those options. Uh, now, Mark's Marauders, we were coming over here to see if we couldn't find the pirate base, but it looks like it's not in this sector. So let's keep looking. Because we're pretty sure okay. they were somewhere over here. Right. This is the direction they came from, anyway. So do they have a space station over here someplace? There would be a, a space station over here someplace for these pirates. Okay. And if we can't find them over here, I'm just going to send the military fleet to Bernard Star because we haven't had any communication or sensor range of that thing and the last thing we knew there was a pirate fleet there uh, so our civilian ships refused to go there. Now, we ah, know we right. blew up that fleet but they won't listen to us until we send a new sensor ship over there to find out. Alright, so we're almost done researching this here and this, and we're going to be getting p Pitharian dust. Now, that's another thing to consider is the when you're choosing uh, research, the cost is sometimes quite different. And this one's taking oh, yeah, quite is, a long time. Yeah. Encounter in Edor Vang. Uh, Edor Vang is way up here. We've encountered some form of alien vessels that have been flagged as jackalopes until we can learn more about them. Well, let's... Let's go take a look at these things. Ooh, that's interesting. Shall we divert our society research to ex try to determine what these jackalopes are? They're pretty strong, uh, 357. Well, I always think it's a good idea to know what the heck's out there near our galaxy, our right. stuff. <laughs> Diverting our... What about you? I mean, that's sure. All right, there's a new election. This is something that only happens uh -oh. for the... Uh, for the republics and democracies of the anomaly. galaxy. And we've got mm -hmm. another anomaly. This one has a failure risk of zero, so I'm gonna say definitely do that, yep. Okay. Uh, and then we come back to this. So our current president, Dolores Muwanga, she is an explorer, which means science ships are reduced in cost and anomaly research speed is higher. And she is charismatic, which means edict cost and edict duration 
are more beneficial to us. She also uh, had a mandate, which I don't know if we beat yet. Actually, we never finished that uh, orbital research mandate because we've been saving up for a combo oh. ship. So we lost out on a little bit of uh, free influence, but we're doing okay on influence right now. We're halfway towards the total cap, so it's, it's, it is what it is. We got stuck building that stupid fleet to deal with the pirates. So we could uh, choose to back any of these candidates and doing so, supporting them would increase the percent that they actually get. We can't directly guarantee that they'll be uh, voted in, but we could spend 50 influence to support a particular candidate. Now, these are the okay. mandates. Uh, the mandates are similar to the re research station thing, which is build a lot of research stations, get some influence as a reward. These ones are build a bunch of mining stations, get influence as a reward. They're all the same. She's still an orbital researcher. She wants to build more research stations and get the reward. She is also orbital researcher, orbital researcher. So all of these are either off-world miner or orbital researcher. Very pacifistic, infrastructure-driven uh, candidates so far. Um, now, it's worth noting... All of these people are already other leaders in our empire. This guy is the governor of Earth. This guy is our society researcher. This guy is oh. our engineering researcher. Uh, this one is our physics researcher. This one is the one that's... Uh, this is the admiral of our... Uh, the USS Cadwall, which I think um, Mark's Marauders <laughs> ship. Right, right. Okay, um, and then that's the... Uh Research scientist, the research on, the scientist on, the, on the ship. So we don't want her to become president because she's a nice three star and she's got uh, she, she's she's helping. Um, our, you know, we want a three star scientist on our ship because we want to get to five stars eventually. To there are certain anomalies that can only really be researched with five stars. So we don't want her to become president. Uh, we could stick with uh, Dolores Muanga. As well, she's got that choice. five star. What, I mean, what what is the value of those five stars? It's a high level of skill. The leader would get monthly unity of plus 15% and it lowers edict costs, which are pretty good. We didn't talk too much about edicts yet. Now, another thing that's beneficial here is uh, this one's got constructor build costs of 10, 25%, mining station build costs of 25%. Um, I kind of like that guy personally. We have a lot of mines to build. Yeah. Defense platform and fortress focused monthly influence, though. Deep connections. That's kind of nice, too. Weapons damage deep and armies damage. This guy's warlike. He increases our weapon damage and army damage, as well as deep connections. He's got the plus one influence. Our other options here, monthly influence and science ship and anomaly. So this is similar to her, uh, but instead of being charismatic, she has the monthly influence. This guy, spaceport build cost and module cost reduction, and expansionist, frontier outpost build cost and influence cost are reduced for colonies. That's pretty good, too. So we don't want her. So what do you think? Well, as I said, um, I don't know enough about edicts to want to go for Dolores, but otherwise I'd go for Cebu Olianya All right, let's do it. So we choose him. We say support. And, and that gives him from, a better chance of uh, Right winning, now he's right? only got a 15% chance. If we support him, it jumps up to 26%. We can spend another 50 and support him again if you want to. Well, I don't know. What How much? What are we spending here? Influence? Influence. We've got 474 you said we're left. At, we were already halfway to our cap. Yep. Uh, I don't know. Maybe jack it up twice. I mean, I don't know. How high can we get it? We got it to 35%. Um, which is good because again uh, we don't want her to become president. That would that would kind of set us back a bit. So let's do it one more time. All okay. Right. All right. So he's forty two percent. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good deal. So let's stop there. I think it's diminishing returns too. All right. So right. the election will take place in fifty five days, and we'll see what the outcome is. It's kind of odd that the incumbent candidate doesn't have a ninety percent chance of winning. I don't understand. You would think they would have some kind of boost. <laughs> So we're saving up for the other colony. There are a lot of things I want to improve here, like uh, the mining network one to mining network two would increase the mineral production of these two tiles, but we're saving up. Got to put the foot down. Don't spend resources. Here's our first technology. The fusion reactor's finished. So this, wow. see the deflectors has 39 of 403. That is a permanent card that would be down here. But since we want to show off how ships are produced and upgraded, we're going to choose that. Okay. Plus, it's just good for our fleet to have deflectors. Um, and we never did find that pirate base. 
So New ruler has been there. elected. We got Cebu. Cebu. Way to go, Cebu, Cebu, Cebu. All right, meanwhile, the Lagrange has recovered an elongated metal box from the surface of Edor Vong 9A. Clusters of small perforations on five sides lead them to believe it's not a container, but some sort of aerosol dispersal device. Initial huh? tests seem to confirm their suspicions as trace aromatics still emanate from the object. A special project has been issued to confirm whether this might be an information-carrying device constructed by some alien race communicating primarily through the secretion of and reception of atmosphere-borne chemical compounds. Smells. I.e. smells. <laughs> <laughs> nice of them to do that. Uh, now, because Cebu was elected to president, we need to fill the slot as an, for an engineer uh, to be here so we can recruit a new scientist for his slot. Now, it's engineering, which is uh, usually the yellow uh, technologies. Like, if we look here and we looked at these options, you can see they're all the sort of this orangey color on the engineering uh, okay. side. They're either right, rocketry right, right. or material science or something else. Sometimes you'll get something like Voidcraft, like like uh, technology for uh, for that, which is what we're currently researching. But as a general rule, you'll see more of those orange ones show up, which means if you have a choice, um, you'd want to look for a guy with an orange technology to slot down there as the highest and most useful. However, Maniacal is also pretty useful. He's just plus 5% across the board, um, rather than being plus 10% ah. for a very specific thing. Right, so right, right. I would say we recruit him and put him yeah. in charge of the engineering department. There we go. Okay, great. So we're almost to the correct amount to get Sirius set up. Uh, and uh, let's see. As soon as this is complete, we can talk about how to improve your spaceships and, and show off that whole interface. So we'll go to Sirius here and take a look. Uh, where would we put a ship? We'd put it right here, I think. Is there another option somewhere on this planet that would give us the full effect? I don't think so. We could put it here, but the boost wouldn't apply to the science tile. So I think That's here's right. the only real option to get all four adjacencies. So now we have finished this. Spaceport level two is available to us. And we got a couple of options here. Uh, let's see. Nano composite armor is another choice for things that we could use to upgrade our ships. Afterburners is a special thing that we can put on our ships as well. Engineering facility. We're not going to need an engineering facility because what that does, and I haven't talked about this yet, but let's take a look at this basic science lab on Earth. All of mm -hmm. these tiles that produce science, you build a basic science lab first. Basic science lab provides one of each. And right, in this case, right. it's stacked on top of this tile that produces one engineering already, so it produces a total of one, one, two. We can upgrade basic science labs to go down one of the three paths exclusively. Not exclusively, I'm sorry, but it'll improve two, one, one instead of one, one, one because we've already researched the physics lab. Now, if we get an engineering lab, we'll just get one that does one, one, two. But right. since we already have more than enough engineering research from our space-borne uh, research stations, as well as our tile here, which provides an extra plus one, getting extra engineering research, getting the head of the curve on that doesn't seem as valuable as preventing us from slipping behind on one of these others. That's the way I usually look at it. I don't think mm, it's the okay. only way to look at it, but I would rate this as less valuable. Then we have options for strategic resources. This one improves energy weapon damage. We don't have any lasers. Explosive weapon damage. This one could be valuable. So I'll leave it to you. Nano composite armor, afterburners, which improve the combat speed of your ships, or strategic resource that improves explosive weapon damage. And uh, our missiles are explosive weapons, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, well, it's a tough call here between the uh, the nano composite armor. I'm not really a defensive-minded guy, but... And we already do have um, shields to fill the defensive slots if we wanted, so... I, I, I'd say let's go for that resource revelation. All right. Hopefully we'll find some somewhere in our empire. So first we have to research that ability. Yep. Okay. All right. We finally have enough. Let's uh, colonize the planet here. Okay. Right on that spot. What do we want to name this one? Uh, we can name this one... Markopolis? <laughs> <laughs> Kylopia. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. There we go. Yes. So we have a couple situation log. We're still investigating these jackalopes. Yeah, that's right. 
We also have this orfactoral study available. Uh, so we can go to this one requires a scientist. We can use this button to go to that spot. And we could take our science ship and again do the control shift thing and say we want to research this first and then go back to surveying the rest of those areas. We'll find out more about how this weird theoretical smell complex worked. Meanwhile, we have uh, minerals we can use to upgrade our mineral input or other things. So I'm going to use it to that end. I'm going to build... Uh, I'm going to upgrade our mineral production here. So you could click on the thing, click on upgrade, and choose the mining network 3. But because there's only one upgrade path for mining networks and not more than one, you yes. can just click this. Oh, okay. Okay, we know about the jackalopes are now known as the T-Yank... Yankee. Docile creatures capable of assessing some lower dimension of subspace. They roam from system to system with remarkable ease. They graze on gases, commonly uh, common to the upper layers of many gas giants. It's highly unlikely to say the least that this is their only food source, but intake of other nutrients is yet to be observed. They will rarely, if ever, attack even when provoked. They can be safely ignored. And they are lovingly okay. known in the Stellaris community as the space cows. Space cows. Well, okay, that makes sense. Space cows. So we run into these from game to game, is what you're saying. Yes. Right. Space cows, space amoebas, space crystalline weird things. Uh, aha! A whiff of something. We've been researching that box. And the true nature is a collection of fairly short narratives told through smells. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. The techniques used to store and reproduce specific smells is of some interest, but the tales it tells are not. <laughs> we don't care what it says. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's funny. You would think that you'd want to research that kind of information. Could You never know, but all right. <laughs> the crew are left with the uncomfortable feeling that they be can become unwittingly become in intimately familiar with what certain gaseous byproducts of alien digestion smell like. However, Sylvia is unwilling to speculate as to why the box was dumped in this frozen hellscape of a planet. <laughs> <laughs> so boom 120 science uh society research that is a ridiculous order of magnitude more than we produce every month so that's a huge wow. boost. uh so if we yeah. look here it's going to go from 56 months probably down to 30 something boom 30 months big huge boost Cut, saved us more than a year that's awesome and she gained a level from doing all that research now this just tells us we have inactive buildings. It's like, hey, on your home world, you have buildings which are not currently being utilized. So what we could do is right. take somebody who doesn't have a building and move them here. Boom, that'll solve that problem. Um, okay. At least to some degree. No, we didn't because we still have an MNF building over here because everybody keeps migrating to Marco. So now I have to build you. You had buildings back on Earth. And now I have to build you extra buildings here <laughs> in Marcos because you refuse to stay in one place. <laughs> That's kind of frustrating, but okay. Yeah, now, strange. one, two, three, four, five. Once you get at least five pops, you can upgrade the reassembled ship shelter into the planetary administration. And the main boost there is it goes from producing two energy to producing four energy and one unity. So that's pretty... It also... Uh, governing ethics attraction is plus 15%. So it prevents people from uh, moving to factions that are... Uh, far away from what your governing ethics are. So if we're like a democratic, utopia, egalitarian faction, eh, there's somebody that might flip over to like an authoritarian, militaristic, xenophobic faction. You never know. It can happen. It's a, it's a percentage chance. But if you upgrade to a planetary administration, that chance is lowered. It increases the governing ethics attraction to these pops on this planet. So that's another right. reason to upgrade to the planetary administration. The last reason is this reassembled ship shelter doesn't have any of those cool adjacency modifiers, but the planetary no. administration does, and everything wow. higher than the planetary administration does as well. That's the adjacency effect. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. All right, so we could take our construction ship and go back to the whole uh, research station thing. Now. Uh-oh. We got, we got some traditions or something. Traditions are available. That's just the oh, culture sign, I guess. So we have enough minerals to build a single research station. Yet if I right click on here and try to build a research station, it'll say you can't because the when you click on a star system to give an order it's for building stations, it always tries to build all of them at the same time. That's your only option. 
If you want to build a specific one, you have to zoom in and choose the specific one. So I could right click ah. on Bernard Star and say build these research stations. But I'm just going to wait until we have a little bit more minerals. So now we're right. back on the choosing the new tradition. So our choices oh, okay. within prosperity are fleet logistics, which reduces our ship upkeep. Administrative uh, operations, which reduces our building upkeep. And the main difference there we can see is ship maintenance is minus three energy and minus one mineral. Whereas building maintenance is minus six, five energy and no minerals. Oh. Then we also have the private colony ship we were talking about there. And then under that is later <laughs> access to energy grids and energy nexuses giving us two unity. I don't know if we even have energy grids yet. Those are the equivalent of the special mining thing that you can only build one per planet and it boosts your output by 10% for the whole planet. Uh, we don't have energy grids yet, so that isn't quite valuable to us yet. Uh, but no. these are both very valuable to have eventually over the course of the game. Um, so right. do you right. want to continue down the prosperity tree? Let's do it for the sake of, of the showing what the ascension perks are. So which yeah, of these three ahead. should we do? Uh, well... Private colony ship might help so we can stop spending minerals on, uh, on colony yeah, ships. Yeah, it gives us more flexibility. I do like that. Yes, okay. I actually don't know how much they cost. I've never really checked. But let's find out. If we click on colonize over here... We could choose between one that costs uh, 298 minerals or 149 energy. That's not much. So let's pay for well, it. Well, that's, that's a huge uh, That's a good boon. discount. That's, yeah. And, and this now is, we this can is far it. out there. This is this is pretty far away. Do we want to name it something that... Uh, yes, Avalon? far. Far, yeah, all right. far, far, uh, far away. I was going to say far away, but that's so corny, isn't it? Actually, I don't know if you've read, there's a book series uh, called the, Far. Um, what is it called? The the Commonwealth Saga uh, by uh. Peter F. Hamilton. Anyway, look, we'll, we'll call it Far Away in honor of his, his book. Sure. They have a planet that's very far on the outskirts of human, they, it's literally called Far Away. All right. So we're fast forwarding through and we are going to be colonizing two things at the same time, which is going to kill our energy power credit income. But that's OK, because we've got plenty in the bank. So we're fine. Who cares? We can deal with it. Meanwhile, our construction ships, as soon as we get to the next level of minerals, we'll be able to build our research stations here and that will help our mining or our, our research output. This is good. What were those lines that were? What are those? The, those this are the line lines here? of our. Yes, what is... Oh, that those is, are that is the, that's the range yeah. of our warp drive right now. Ah, okay. Uh, we have found a level 2 anomaly with a 0% failure risk, so yes, definitely research that. Meanwhile, the construction ship is going to come over here and do build these two research stations. Oh, we were talking about building frontier outposts, and I never actually properly explained that. I think it might be time that we do so. All right. So... You can see that there are no habitable worlds over here. There is an Arctic and a savanna world but no mm -hmm. habitable worlds. There are, however, a lot of min, min, uh, uh, resources here. And in the adjacent stars, there's a few. So what I'm going to do is next... What is that law? Is that a black hole? That's a black hole, yeah. But we can study it for, for engineering research. There might be practical applications for using the black hole. So instead, actually, yeah. what I'm going to do, uh, just for the demonstration purposes, is I'm going to unspend those resources because I never actually spent them. Uh, and I'm going to build a frontier outpost over here. It's going to cost 200 minerals and uh, 123 influence because of how far away it is from our space. Now, frontier outposts have a maintenance cost of one influence per month. So we can only build up to three of them. And if we did, we would then get basically no influence per month at that point. So here's the anomaly we found. The structures are uh, not as old as we first believed. Blah, blah, blah. Found them. And as a result, we get 90 society research and 126 engineering research, which is quite a lot. Now, why did we go from... Oh, because Earth probably had another person leave the science area. Damn it. Probably. <laughs> Stop it. Progress. System survey complete. They really want to get off the old planet, don't I they? I guess so. We'll have this guy uh, build a basic mine for this guy. Now, oh, you know what? No, we're going to cancel that. Because the other thing is you'll notice you can only build a basic mine, which is a one output. You can't build Mining Network 1, which we can build on Earth, because certain buildings require higher level capitals in order to build. So 
we're going to wait until we can upgrade this capital before we build anything else so that we can jump straight to the good building instead of building the, the basic form first. Upgrade the capital? What do you mean? The uh, administration? The reassembled thing? ship shelter would yes. be uh, oh, upgraded right. to a planetary administration. Ah, right. Okay. Okay. That's the capital version, the capital set of buildings. It goes reassembled ship shelter, planetary administration, planetary capital, and then empire capital, I think, which can only have one in the empire. But we haven't researched those buildings yet. We don't know how to make those better versions of a capital. Uh, we'll get them eventually. Okay. All right, so we're going to speed things along here. And meanwhile, uh, we are just about closer to getting... Well, we're not very close to getting deflector shields, unfortunately. I was hoping that we were. But let's take a look at the other things that we haven't looked at. So we've looked at contacts. Uh, I think we've looked at the government tab a little bit. You can see the breakdown of the budget here. We've looked at demographics of... Uh, you can see the, the, uh, the total... Uh, sort of benefit to all the different passive benefits we get to these various things. And we've also looked at uh, factions. We haven't looked too much at edicts or... Uh, we, we looked very briefly at policies and how they relate to factions. Factions want certain policies and certain policies restrict you from doing certain things. Well, one of the things that could bite you in these games is not realizing there's something that you really need to monitor on a regular basis. That and would be the factions. You... And the factions you can see are down in the okay. bottom corner here. Uh, so you can keep an eye on that and see if it's causing any major... Uh, right now you can see, oh, 60%, that's great. Don't even have to care, because these guys are happy. Uh, if another okay. faction pops up, that could be a problem. Before you make any changes to your policies, check your factions and find out if changing them would upset these guys significantly. It could reduce their happiness by quite a bit. Mm. But, let's talk about edicts. Edicts come in two forms. Empire-wide edicts and planetary-specific edicts. So right now, in this screen here, this is empire-wide edicts. Oops, I closed it. Uh, and these are the default ones that we have access to. Information quarantine is something that you can increase the governing ethics attraction by 25%, and that's if you have a lot of bad factions that are upset at the way that things are, and you're trying to pull them back to the governing faction. So if you're a democracy and you get a bunch of authoritarian jerks that are mad because you don't have hereditary rule, well, you can try to do an information quarantine to get them to think more like you. Or the opposite, encourage three th free thought to boost your research speed if you don't care about it. Yeah, we got plenty of governing ethics attraction. We don't have any problems with these factions. Let's try and make some. Um, you can All also right. focus your research in a particular area. So. Right now, if we had a lot of society and engineering research, we could click this to try to sacrifice. This is similar to in EU4, how you choose a focus on your administrative uh, task there. You could say, I want to focus on administrative and minus one to each of the other two and plus two to this, right? So I, that's I what see. These yes, are. yes. Throughout the game, right. you'll also unlock more edicts. And they will be things like the Grand Fleet, the Grand Navy. And that will boost your naval capacity and lower your naval upgrade costs while you have it active. But all of these, for the most part, cost you monthly influence to maintain. So mm. that's not something you want to do on a regular basis unless it gives you a very good output. And this is simply saying, hey, because of the guy we have in charge, they cost less than normal. And how do we increase our influence uh, gathering right there now are a couple ways. plus three there are a couple ways if you okay. declare a rivalry with another empire out there you can mm. generate influence that way if you have factions that are happy they also generate influence they're actually generating a lot of our influence oh they are uh, the base is two the factions are giving us an additional plus 2.34 uh, which is great so lastly there are technologies. If you recall, we had the technology option earlier um, in the society research to uh, increase our monthly influence by one. And that's a tree of tech. Oh, I, I clicked the wrong thing here. Uh, we want to continue researching deflectors. If you continue down that, if you get that monthly influence, the next political one will open up. You can get another plus one influence there. So the technology is the main way to do it. Our admiral has gained the fleet logistician trait. And that's just something either after a battle or sometimes randomly they'll gain some cool thing. So their ship upkeep is minus 10%. Great, fantastic. No problems there. So we were talking about these edicts. So this is the empire-wide edicts. They cost a per month uh, cost. 
There are mm-hmm. also planetary-based edicts, which last for 10 years and have a flat influence cost. Complete. So re-education campaign is a similar thing. It makes, if, if you've got a bunch of pops that are unhappy because they're in the wrong faction, you can use this to try to get them to join a different faction, the, the good faction, the faction of the leaders. Uh, you can also, if we want to try to encourage people to migrate to a new place, I've never found a real reason to care too much about this, but you can do that. You can also do infrastructure projects. If you uh-huh. are planning to build a lot on a planet for the next 10 years, building cost minus 25%, build speed plus 33%. That's quite good if you've just settled a brand new planet like Sirius, for example. Let's put it on Sirius here, uh, or uh-huh. Kylopia, as soon as it's done. Uh, Meanwhile, we can check out the other option here is Grassroots Administration, which boosts your energy credits by 20%. That's incredible. I think I didn't see that on my main playthrough. This must be only available to, to, uh, yeah, the Fanatic Egalitarian Edict. So these are based on the ethics of your empire. You get different ones. Because, for example, (laughs) in my authoritarian, xenophobic empire, I had um, uh, something that pacified the populace and made them happy. I don't remember what it was called. Um, but it was, uh, it was pretty <laughs> that useful. like a wonder drug of some yeah. kind. All right. So another okay, science. So... Up. Oh, our science ship is, is, is idle. That's unacceptable. Uh-oh. space Born amoebas uh, over here. Was there a, uh, flag telling you that it was idle? Or you I just, just noticed, noticed that it had the zzz next to it. Uh, so we okay. do have a level three, uh, research here that we skipped before because it was 20%. Now we're going to do it because it's 10%. Okay. Yeah, that's the threshold. Uh, Let's have them continue to survey the systems around us. Now, I believe we had mentioned exploring what exactly the benefits of a frontier outpost are. You can see we built a frontier outpost and poof, we've got control of this system and these two adjacent systems. Now we can exploit all of these resources. And the only penalty is that we have to pay the minus one monthly influence cost. So where you place your frontier outposts is very important. You want to pick a resource-rich localized area to try and Mm -hmm. build them in so that you can then exploit all those resources there. Um, You can focus, for example, on an area that has a very close cluster of stars. Uh, So right here might get you one, two, three, four, five stars initially. And maybe it'll expand to get more, but we don't know what's on those stars. So you don't want to just send a resource. So, oh yeah, build one there. No, you want to explore those first and find the ones that have big groupings of resources. So for example, we can send our construction ship here to build all these mining nodes and to build all these research stations. So now it's just going to build all of these things and get us all those resources, which is great. Um, And the, um, the, the, uh, with the frontier outpost here also acts as a mining for this energy credit. So we got a plus two energy credit just for building that there. That's kind of nice. So now we are exploring, we are researching, and we're going to be very soon talking about more of these things here. So that's policies and edicts. We talked a little bit about factions last time and Uh strategic resource overview can be found here. We right now don't have any strategic resources. Here's the anomaly. Uh, There's moons, has a terminal orbit, we can uh, observe and record the event, which will be a special project. So uh, this requires a scientist that has a skill three or higher. So I'm gonna tell them to come back and do that first. Again, control shift to add to the front of your order, shift plus execute to uh, add to the end. So let's go back Uh in here. Uh, Species, this is where you can, I believe we talked a little bit about earlier, set the rights for your species. And you can look at all these and hover over the tooltips and see exactly what these allow you to do. So we okay, could just just one clarification. Oh, you sure. said shift plus execute or shift plus control. Shift con- shift control adds to the front. Just shift by itself adds to the end of a queue. Shift by itself. Yep. Okay, that's what you meant. I gotcha. Gotcha. So for example, we could turn off migration controls. Well, we can't yes. because uh, we are fanatic we egalitarian. Fanatic egalitarian doesn't let us do it. Which means that that's why we're having all these people migrate every yeah. all over the place. Now, well, there's a disadvantage to that, I assume. Yeah, that means well, we the advantage is that it's real easy to keep these people happy, as you can see. Ah, right. Uh, this is because this but is But it's not efficient production, is it? It's not going to be as efficient. No. And now, oh, here's a new problem. Let me click on this first. We got, we've uh, potentially researched Pitharian dust. Let's do new research. 
Uh, border range plus 20%, Galactic Ambitions. This one's always valuable. Um, also, we have Engross Vapor, which increases the habitability of everything. It's a naturally occurring stimulant that helps all forms <laughs> of life adapt and evolve. Also, a bio ah, lab. I this was is, wondering how you could increase habitability. This is one species. way. If you find this strategic resource, that's helpful. Now, we also got Energy Siphon, which was one of those technologies we discovered after the battle. This is a special mm. type of uh, laser type attack that does twice as much damage to shields. So that's pretty valuable, but this card is always available because we have some progress on it. We can always come back here and do it. We, yeah, we haven't found anybody we need that for yet. No, and it's worth noting, since I hovered over this, the cost of research is is determined by A, the tier of that research. There's three, there's actually four different tiers of research within the game. The higher tiers cost more and usually require research that is earlier on. So you won't see high tier research at the beginning because we have to build a base of scientific knowledge before we can get there. It's also increased by the number of planets and the number of pops in your empire. I never have to worry about research again. No, you have to continue to expand your research operations as you expand your empire. Mm. Uh, that's all that means. So I think border range can be very valuable because it could mean the difference. Actually, in this case, it's not valuable now that I'm looking around. Uh, <laughs> because right now, uh, for example, if this uh, pila was just barely out of range of our border, this could help us get access to it. 20% might actually get us up to this Sawamia. We don't know what that is yet. But you do eventually get to points where you're like, damn, I wish I'd taken that border range earlier so that I could actually get to uh, these planets that are just on the border. Um, so this is pretty valuable, the strategic resource potentially. The biolab could also be valuable to us because, again, our society research and our physics research are both falling behind here. Uh, what do you think? What do you think? Hmm... Let's see here. I like that border range right away. Let's do I it. I always like expanding borders. Okay. Now. I'm sort of an expansionist. I don't know if that goes with Federation tech, Federation mentality. Uh, but. Maybe. Maybe for a while. As long as there's no anybody, people in those things. Uh, now, <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. uh, we have a problem. We have too many colonized systems directly. This number up here represents how many colonies you can directly control uh, versus indirectly control. This is okay. a system in the game to deal with the fact that when you get into the late game of 4X strategy games like Civilization, for example, you can go from happily managing five cities to managing 40 cities. So your turns can just be an impossible long-term tedium when you go to, okay, this, yes, build this, yes, build that, okay, okay, yep, okay, yes, yes, build this, build that, oh, that, and then three minutes later, you're finally at the thing you, where you want to hit end turn. This game deals with that by forcing you to delegate some of your responsibilities to sectors. So, due to the okay. fact that this is further away, uh, these kind of are our core planets, this is kind of like a sector out on its own, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go to planets and sectors, which we haven't talked about yet. And right. we're going to create a new sector. Right now we can have a total of three sectors if we wanted to, and that is increased by technology usually and number of planets. So we're going to give this to the sector. We'll also give this to the sector. You can only expand it to things that are adjacent. So we could expand it all the way over to here if we wanted to. And just for the sake of argument, let's do so. Okay. So now the sector covers this whole area. Now, what does so that do? Then we hit close okay. at the bottom here to exit the sector mode. What does that do? Well, let's go back into the planets and sectors section. You can now see the far away sector is represented here. And this represents, at the moment, only one planet. But normally you'd combine a bunch of planets under this. So you sure. control three directly, then you have a sector that controlled three, another sector that controlled four, another sector that controls six, whatever. You can set it up however you want. But the way this works, minor mandate fulfilled. Oh, excellent, because this guy was elected because he wanted to build a bunch of mines, mining stations. We've done it, and so we've gained 250 influence. Boom. But yeah, that's a little easier than the research station one. It is. 
So now, if you'll notice, if we go to this planet, we don't have direct control anymore. We can't upgrade. We can't build. We can't do anything directly on the surface of the planet. The AI is going to take over for us. Can we take nominate a governor? I see that we, we can. Didn't have a we governor. can put a governor in charge. In this case, it's the governor of the sector controls all of the planets and his stars benefit all the planets. So if he has four stars worth of uh, four levels, then what his ability. So we can click change and we recruit a new governor. And this one has building cost and build speed reduction, which is great because we just put him in charge of a brand new planet. This one increases food production and hydroponics farm build costs. Let's quick quickly take a look at that planet again um, and see. What does it got? It doesn't have a lot of hydroponics building, so it's probably not as valuable. So if we go back here, we can also see environmental engineer clear blocker time reduced oh, that might and be reduced good. in cost. That would be good for that planet. We we don't currently know how to clear those blockers, but we will soon. Oh, that's a problem. That is a we problem. will soon. There's they're they're 48. By the time they're dead, so they have a guaranteed age limit of 72, I think, uh, in the game. And then oh, after really? that, there's a chance of them <laughs> okay. dying every year. So let's recruit this one because that is going to be quite valuable as soon as we are able to do that. So now if we go back how, to that How planet, hard is it to change governors? It's easy. You just click change and then you choose a new governor. But this limit is a leader limit of 10. And I, and I think, I don't know, we can dismiss the governor. It's just that it's going to cost you another 50 influence or what have you, right? So it's wasteful to be doing that. It's wasteful to change it a lot. Right. Um, so you can see this governor is reducing the unrest by five because of their skill. It's reducing the build cost, uh, 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 sorry, increasing build speed by five and lowering clear blocker time by six per skill level. Plus they have that special uh, ability that made them also lower clear blocker time and decrease, reduce clear blocker cost. Now her benefit are across the entire sector. So if we ever settled more planets here, that would be great. But like I was saying, we've lost the ability to do anything directly on the planet's surface. We can still declare edicts for the planet. We can still build a spaceport here. Uh, and we can still recruit armies here. So we can still do okay. the empire-wide things. But what else can we do about with this, with regards to this sector? How can we direct the sec sector governor on how to build their things? Well, sector settings allows us to say Balance focus. Focus on all things. Minerals, food, energy, and research. Or we can say, focus on agriculture in this sector. Or focus on industrial. Or focus on research. What this basically means is, if they have a lot of choices for building uh, mining stations, for example, mm -hmm. or for building things on a planet, they will generally choose your focus first. So if they have a choice between a, a tile on a planet that builds energy and a tile on a planet that builds food and you told them to focus on energy, they're going to go for building that energy first. What that also means, this is a special project we just completed about the collision between we watched the moon crash into the planet and we learned a lot about physics. Yay! So what that means <laughs> is if they have an empty tile and you've told them to focus on energy, they're going to build an energy building there. If you've told them to focus on research, they're going to build a research building there. So okay. that's what the focus right. does. It okay. focuses those empty tiles into specific things. Okay. And you can choose that by choosing one of these buttons at the top. So we can say financial focus, research focus, etc., cetera, um, and that will ch change how they build. We can also say whether we want them to construct military stations or not, because military stations cost upkeep. Maybe we say no, no military stations for you right now. We could also say, do we want them building military uh, uh, mining stations, or do we want to be the only ones building? No, eh, we'll have them build mining stations, sure. Um, we can say whether we want them to colonize or if we want to have control of that. We can say, do we want them to respect tile resources, which is only build food type things on food tiles or just overwrite the food tiles and build nothing but energy in this sector. Ha ha. Or we can say whether we want them to redevelop. Like if we give them control of a planet that we developed a lot of, do we allow them to redevelop it or do we want them to leave the buildings that we put in charge? Also, do they build huh. robots? Lots of stuff. So the other controls that we have here, manage sector, by the way, this button allows you to add and remove elements from the sector. We don't care about that right now because we like it the way that it is. Yeah, but the thing is, we can't do this with the sectors we don't control, just the sector we can control. No, we control all right. sectors. All the things that I'm showing you, 
This is oh, this how is you okay. control sectors. The things we can't do is go to an individual planet in the sector and control it directly. We can instead oh, okay. declare, hey, governor, I want you to focus on energy. And then they make the choices of how to build that out. I see. Got it. Got it. I had misunderstood. Okay. So this shows how many energy credits are being sent to you from this sector and how many minerals mm -hmm. are being sent to you. All research is automatically, 100% of it is sent up to the Empire level to you. You get a benefit of all research. Sectors have no use for it. However... Okay. Uh, excess food is, by the way, also sent to the... But we don't have any being done there, so... Yeah. However, okay. locally, the sector keeps a portion of its mineral and energy output. So you can see yes. here that they keep two... Uh, of the energy and they send two up to us. They keep one and they send one up to us. That's because the taxes, the sector contribution, are currently set to 50%. Now, what does that matter? Well, a sector can only build buildings and pay for buildings with the things that, are, that it keeps locally. So if you right. want a sector to develop build buildings on its planets, build mining stations on the uh, the giants, the gas giants and the, the asteroids and things. You need to let them keep some resources locally. So maybe when a sector is first being built out, you set their taxes to low, which means they keep right. everything. Or you can put it on 25%, 50%, or 75%. Those are your only options. You can't take all of it. So you have so to give up So it's 75%, it says four plus one. Four is their current amount in their and stockpile. And they're keeping one. And they're keeping and they're one. three. Right. Yeah, so so they're, in this case, uh, they're gaining okay. less than one mineral per month. So because it's a brand new one and we don't really need the minerals that bad, I'm going to leave it at 25%. I'm going to let them keep 75% of what they produce. If you want to give them a jump start on something, you can also send them a bunch of minerals. Just ah. send them 400 minerals. That'll give them a jump start. If you hover over this little thinking bubble, which is a re recently added in the banks patch, it tells you what the AI is planning to construct. In this case, it's planning to construct a spaceport for defensive operations and to allow them to build uh, constructor ships, which will let them exploit all the resources on the asteroids and such. Okay. So this is how you add planets. You click Manage Sector. You can add planets to the sector, etc., etc. And you have to do that when you get above three planets in the base set because if you don't you'll get a permanent like penalty to your income in all forms which is bad obviously and so does that's, this affect their happiness that taxation as well no it doesn't affect happiness in any way taxation only affects how much you leave in the sector uh which okay. directly affects how much they're able to do in terms of development on your behalf so one way that you could do it, depending upon how you feel, is you could leave the taxes on like really high and rely only on yourself to say, I will deign to give you minerals when I want you to develop things when we have extra minerals to spare. Or you can say, I'm going to put them on 25% for now and let them develop. Uh, and then later on, when they're mostly fully developed, I'll increase it up to 75 or something. You can kind of set it up however you want. Uh, so Space Amoeba is over near that sector, which is bad. Um, and... Let's see. Alpha Centauri still has some research stations that we can rebuild here. So let's find our construction ship and tell him, hey, come over here and build these research stations. Uh, meanwhile, we are just about done three months away from our deflectors, which means we'll be able to take a look at how you build out your ships. Uh, so Okay, that'll be a good place to probably wind yeah, up. I, I think, think just then we're we basically talk. done after we look at the ship upgrades and how oh, those really? work. Oh, really? Okay, so, great, great. Um, okay. Let's see. We've talked a little bit about the species window and how you set your rights for your species here. If you had more species living in your empire, then you'd care about yes. that. Yes. Which, because we're an egalitarian federation builder, we might very well mind up like that. Otherwise, you might, like, conquer a species and uh, take, take control of them. Um, here, we're just going to pick one. Ah, energy grid is nice because that boosts your energy credits, kind of like that special mining building. We also have the option to get improved deflectors because we've got the first version. However, the improved deflectors are going to cost more power. So maybe we don't want to get improved deflectors until we get a better power plant for our ships. Uh, now, question here, if you have these uh, populace, as we've seen, traveling from one of our own planets to a different planet, mm -hmm. free will... Can they actually do that and travel to one of these alien cultures as if well? If we have an 
uh, migration agreement. I'm sorry, it's over here. Oh, migration, migration treaty. Yeah. Okay. There is a migration treaty. I see it. Now, the nice. only way to do that is if you have a colonized world that they can actually live on happily. Right now, the problem ah. is uh, we don't have any arid worlds that we have colonized. Uh, and they don't have any continental worlds that they have colonized. So we're kind of uh, SOL there until we can do that. So one ah, of the okay. ways, so th there's a couple ways that you can get a other alien species in your empire, which can be valuable because mm -hmm. it, it's an alternative to terraforming. You can terraform everything to your style and then inhabit it yourself, or you could get alien races that are suited to arid worlds to join your empire and colonize it with them. If that makes sense. It's ah. more of a Star Trek Federation style thing where you have Vulcans and humans were living together in the Federation. Uh, and the Vulcans, so for example, are better to, at arid. So you get them to, to occupy the territory, but you wind up getting some benefits from it. Well, no, it's still a part of your population. It's just that you've got two different races as part of your population. They're part oh, so of your empire completely. Sending some of them to the arid or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so if you conquer ah, okay. a faction of, or a species, for example, that's specialized to arid populations, after a while, you could maybe make them happy in your empire. You could give them rights, and then they'll be happy in your empire. They lose the separatism, and then you could have them colonize all these, like, red worlds that are, that are uh, arid, that are not, that, well, you know, I can't make any use of them, so I might as well have this other species colonize them for me. And they'll be happy as long as you give them full rights to migrate to the core worlds and everything, then you can make them happy after a fashion. You can also come across a primitive species that is specialized to a, you know, a, a climate that you're not specialized to, and you can uplift them. If you find a, a species that's only in the basic space age, like the 1960s equivalent of humans, you can uh, get a research option that allows you to sort of guide them into the stars, and they will potentially join your faction as a vassal, and you can maybe integrate them into your empire. There's a lot of different ways you could get alien species into your empire. But Interesting. Okay. Great. Let's talk about ship designers. Okay. So... We only have access to the Interceptor, and maybe if we speed through this while we're talking about it, we'll get access to um, destroyers, but probably not. Now... You said the Interceptor? Is that the same as the Corvette? That's, sorry, that's the Interceptor hull of the Corvette. That's the only option we have okay. here. So, later on, you'll maybe get access to a Torpedo Corvette mm -hmm. um, f section. So remember, as you get access to the bigger ships, you can change out the sections. Like, for example, the battleship has, like, a long-range big gun hull or something that's like a hangar. So we could change it into, like, a carrier with a bunch of small fighters that come out of it and bombers. So you do that by clicking on this button. Unfortunately, I can't show you anything else because we don't have anything accessed at the beginning of the game here. In fact, you know what? We're going to jump right, out of this and right. jump into my other game to all show right. you this uh, in its in its full glory. Yes, sounds great. That only makes sense. So that way you can see a bunch of how this all works. So we're going to go into the ship designer here, and we're going to choose a new design for a Corvette. And you can see you can choose either the Interceptor or the Torpedo Boat. And okay. the difference here is that the Interceptor has three slots for weapons, and the Torpedo Boat has one small slot and one torpedo slot, which is independent of the small slots. Um, and so now, an S slot, M slot, A slot, those are different sizes? Right, S, S M, and L are sizes L. Okay. for basic weapons. T is a special torpedo mount. And let's okay. look at battleships, because they have all the options available to them. Um, except torpedoes. They have S, M, and L as a broadside bow, or we could just have two large guns, or we could have one medium gun, one hangar slot for fighters and bombers, and two point defense slots, which is something that is utilized against missile weapons, if you remember. And point defense is also much better at shooting down uh, fighters, I believe, and bombers. Or we can have one extra large slot. This is like a spinal mount super Yamato cannon, if you, if you get the <laughs> okay. Um And you know what I can put in here? I can put in a Giga Cannon, but anyway. So it's Spinal Mountain Bow. So these are the five different designs here. These are the five different slots that I could put on my battleship. 
Um, and it changes what utility slots they get at the bottom as well, usually, although in this case it doesn't seem to do so. So we could, for example, wait, wait, broad excuse side. me, let me make, understand this correctly. Each battleship can have up to five of these different nope. we sections. have five choices to put in the bow section of the ship. These are the five bow All right, so choices. now we're talking about the bow. These are our choices. And then Got we it. have another up. section for this core of the ship, and then we have another section for the stern. If you remember, our Corvette only had one section, and the bigger ships have up to three. So we're gonna choose a broadside bow, just as for an example. Then for the core, we could choose a hangar core, uh, or uh, a, a carrier core, which is even more hangar slots. And then we're gonna ah. choose an artillery stern to get two, to get one large gun, or a broadside stern to get uh, two medium-sized guns. So just, just mixing it up. Now, what's the major difference between small, medium, and large weapon slots? Well, you can see that your mass drivers come in small, medium, and weapon uh, and large weapon versions. And if we go up here, you can see all our missiles, basic technologies, all come in all sizes, right? So why would uh -huh. you care about getting one or the other? Well, the way that weapons work in this game is the statistics differ on the damage the cooldown, the accuracy, the tracking, the range, all of those together are averaging this average damage capacity. I think the average damage is actually the damage divided by the cooldown. It does the DPS calculation there for you, right? So it takes the average damage, okay. divides it by the 4.35 cooldown, and gets 13.79. So if you're just looking to see whether weapon X is better than weapon Y, like, hey, how does this energy siphon, which is a different type, compare to nuclear missiles? Well, it's 2.29 uh -huh. per second per time tick versus 1.59 per time tick, but Energy Siphon does double damage to shields. So this does approximately 3.18 to shields, and this does 2.29 and only does a little bit extra damage to shields, right? And then if you uh -huh. look at the mining drone laser, it's 1.89, but it ignores armor. So if you're shooting things with lots of armor, then it does ignores the armor. So this is how you can compare them by hovering over. But... Uh -huh. Okay. What is the difference in choosing? Like, why do we care if we get a broadside bow versus an artillery bow? Why do we care? Well, small weapons have high tracking. And then let me use uh, missiles are a bad example because they kind of break rules. But small mass drivers and small lasers have high tracking, which means they can hit things that have high evasion, like small craft, like corvettes and fighters. So the higher the tracking, the better they are at shooting small things. But medium weapons do more damage per tick, but their tracking is much weaker. Look, you go from small at 60% tracking to 30% tracking at medium to 5% tracking at large. So as a general rule, small weapons do low damage, but are much more likely to be more accurate hitting small ships. Medium weapons have a medium tracking, so they're going to miss small ships more often, but they can hit pretty medium-sized ships pretty well, and they're always going to hit big ships, and they're going to do more damage at them. And then the large weapons are very rarely going to actually hit if they fire at small targets, but they're going to do more damage to large things, right? Large Ooh. guns for killing large things. So in your right. fleet, you want to have a mix of okay. all three. Unless your opponent is coming at you with, like, all Corvettes, then you're like, oh crap, I better get a bunch of small things on these ships. But that's very unusual. Usually you have a mix like you do in the traditional naval setup. You have a, a flagship and a couple of escorts, a big variety battleship size, and then you have a, a greater number of cruisers and then a greater number. That's how I like to do it, but there's a bunch of different ways. Right, okay. Well, I could understand but, the massive fleets of... Uh, ships that are small, overwhelming, or something like that, yeah. that it could be a totally risky strategy, I suppose. Uh, so, so that is how you can determine um, what these things are going to be good at. Small versus okay. small, medium versus medium, large versus large. So when you're all building right. your ships, make sure you have some small. Maybe all your, just, just leave all your, your Corvettes as your small slots, right? Just boom, all my, I'm just gonna have a ton of Corvettes, they do all the small things, and then my battleships are gonna be like this. Large, 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 extra large. So let's suppose that you had just Corvettes for the moment, which is the case right now, and they can only do smalls, and they ran up against a medium or large. So will they have any effect, or will they not even nope, fire? Nope, they'll still, they'll still have an effect, uh, and because right. they're, you're small against larger, they will hit pretty much 100% of the time, because their tracking is good. 
Uh, but these weapons, if we recall here, are only going to do a s much smaller amount of damage to medium and large ships, because it's 2.28 per tick versus 4.52 per tick versus 9.09 .09 per tick. So if you're going up against large things with small weapons, they're still going to hit... They're just going to do less damage per second than large weapons would. Uh, you're, you're sacrificing the ability to hit small things for raw damage output. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. And again, your point defense cannons are things that help you against missiles. They intercept missiles and they help kill small uh, hangar craft. Um, now, we can actually look at, say, a uh, destroyer, which has a bow and a stern section. So you can customize this. Uh, now, you won't see point defense slots or torpedo slots until you actually get uh, those research done. Then the bows and the and the sterns will show up here. So let's take a look at Terence class ships, which are my torpedo class. What are torpedoes good for? Well, if we compare torpedoes to other types, they have 100% shield penetration. So oh, really? They uh -huh. don't have to do bonus damage to shields, uh, like energy weapons usually do bonus damage to shields. They don't have to go, they just ignore them. They go straight through, but their tracking is abysmal. So torpedoes are, like in most games and, and, and media, better at killing big ships, but mm. impossibly useless against small ships. Right. Right. So you can see my torpedo's damage is 10.7 per second here, and it completely ignores the enemy shields and ignores 50% of their armor, whereas my best missiles are just, uh, you know, half again as good, but they only ignore 30% of armor, and they have to go through the shields first. So torpedoes are an extra useful thing to add into your, into your fleet, and maybe not make them the core of your fleet, but they help you kill the big battleships better. Okay, so I think we've talked about pretty much everything that can go up here. And then, of course, you've got fighters and bombers, which, huh. let me see if I have my commander class. No, my hope class is the one I put bombers in. Uh, so you would use bombers bomb. for a, a ground attack on the surface of a colony no, or No, 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 no. These are like uh, Y wings that get in close to the enemy star destroyers and blow them up with bombs. So these, similarly, have 100% shield penetration. These are like torpedoes, but oh. a little strike craft, right? <laughs> Um, and yeah, they come in and they lob their bombs and get the hell out, I yep. suppose. Uh, and come back to the they, ship and then reload. Yeah. They are directly countered by point defense. So if the enemy has okay. a bunch of point defense, then it makes your bombers less effective. Or fighters. Fighters are also good at killing enemy bombers. Is that what you're primarily for, is killing enemy bombers? Yes, because fighters have a decent tracking of 40%. And bombers only have a 0% tracking, so they can only really hit the big things very well. Um, but the bombers obviously do more damage than the fighters, because the fighters don't... Uh, that's, again, you sacrifice tracking for damage. Well, I was wondering, I mean, if you launch a bunch of fighters against a big battleship, I don't know how well that's going to work. Right, that's why you need uh, the bombers. Yeah. yeah. So... Now, are there bombers for bombing the systems? No, we didn't talk about, actually, we didn't talk about conquering, but your entire fleet is capable of bombing a planet. You just place it in orbit above the enemy planet, and yeah. then you will uh, be able to uh, bomb it. Uh, so let's just finish up with the ship designer. That is something yeah. we didn't talk about. Maybe I'll do a separate video about uh, conquering things if we have, uh, you know, something's lined up for that. So later on, yeah. that's okay. all the different weapons I think that you can fit up here. You can get different kinds of weapons. Like an ion disruptor is a type of laser that does huge amounts of damage to shields. So you can time that. The swarmer missiles are specialty missiles that have that come out in groups, so they can overpower an enemy's point defense. But you only get version, medium versions of them. You know, you'll ex you'll explore these as you get access to the, to the various things in the game. But Let's talk about components. Everything on the right-hand side is called a component, and it has the okay. C symbol when you're trying to research it in the technology. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. I've unlocked the jump drive. That's a component. The capacitor field is a component for a defense station. Or uh, here's a point defense ship. Uh, here's a point defense component. Uh, here's some more components. Advanced combat rolls or quantum destabilizer for your fortresses, etc., etc. So that C represents a component, which is on the right-hand side here. Components include things like your type of FTL system. 
All right. So we started with warp in our game. I started with wormholes in this game and eventually unlocked jump drives. Uh, advanced combat computers start at zero. Nothing special. And then eventually, these, by the way, are, spe are, are different per ship class. So because we're looking at a battleship, it, this one just increases the weapons damage on this artillery thing. If we go and instead uh, look at a corvette and look at their cor combat computer, it uh, significantly increases their evasion stat. And if we look at a destroyer, then their combat computer increases their invasion a little bit, but also their tracking, making destroyers especially good at killing enemy corvettes. So this kind of mm. helps nail down the role. And there's one type of computer, as far as I can tell, per class. So you'll always get the okay. when you unlock the computers, you get one for every class, and then you get an advanced one later on. Okay, regular one, advanced one, got yep. it. Okay. And then impulse, and then thrusters. You start with these basic thrusters, and then you increase the speed at which the ship is moving and its chance to evade. Right, Fairly right. simple, that straightforward. And then you can also increase the sensors, which increase the tracking and the sensor range on the ship. Wow, I have only gotten two levels in this one, and I'm like 160 years in. Or more. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, so how that's long do these battles last? Though normally, four hundred years. The game, or? actually, I don't know. I've never finished one. I'm in the middle of oh, finishing okay. this one. I'm de de dedicated because once we get to banks, I'm very happy with the game, and I want to finish it all the way through. All right, so that's the components that can upgrade. Now you'll notice this basic one costs five minerals and no power. This one costs five power. The basic one here costs five power, and when you get all the way up here, it costs twenty power. If we look back at these, the regular mass driver costs 2.5 power. This one costs 12.5 power for a Gauss cannon. Gauss cannon. Oh, so you so, have to have power on the ship. Right. That's where we come to the utility slots at the bottom. These are for ah. power, shields, and uh, armor. Power, so, shields, and armor. It looks like I only see shields there. Oh, it's a zero-point reactor. What this is, is a reactor. That's power. power. So you start with a fission reactor, which produces, say, 10 for a small slot, 20 for a medium slot, and 40 for ah. a large slot. And then you upgrade to 15, 30, 60, etc., 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 until you get to level 5 of these. Now, you're going to need to play around. If you ever can't save your design, it's probably because your power is negative. Like, if I stick some extra shields in place of power here, my power is <laughs> yeah. negative and won't let me save it because this ship literally can't <laughs> go anywhere. Uh, so right. when you're putting okay. your ship okay. together, if you ever run out, you're like, oh, well, I guess I've got to put some more power on this thing. Now, the other things uh, that you can put besides power in this utility slot are deflector shields. So the larger the shield, obviously, the more hit points it has, which larger slots are going to be available on larger ships like battleships. The shields will regenerate at a fairly slow rate. They're not great for use in combat. They're something that you have in combat as a first line of defense so that you won't have to take too much damage uh, in addition to your hit points. So it's like extra hit points right on your ship. But your shields are not going to regenerate in combat so fast that it makes a huge difference. Um, but the bigger shields regenerate faster. So out mm -hmm. of combat, they'll still regenerate. Um, and you can also put armor in these slots. So instead of putting a shield here, let's take a look. We can put armor. Now, the battleship starts with a lot of armor, starts with 30 armor in this case, and the damage reduction is 29%. So any damage it takes that is not ignoring armor or have armor penetration will be reduced by 29%. So instead so of having had shields... A lot, you'd want a laser system to go after that, right? Oh, that the one and we just went from... Armor? 29% resistance to 70% resistance. Wow. Okay. But we have no shields now. So if we're going up against an enemy that has a lot of lasers, which do right. lots of damage to shields but little damage to armor, we might change our design to accommodate that. So you want so to the pay attention. So the lasers nail shields. Is that what you just said? Lasers saying? just do extra damage to shields and kinetic not much weapons. To armor. Kinetic weapons do extra damage to armor. And missiles kind of are even against both. So okay. you can see... I, I'll, that's that rock, paper, scissors thing you got to In look fact, at. because yeah. I used... I got rid of so many shields by by getting rid of the, the, uh, the, the energy, I think we might be able to put some basic shields on here. Yeah. 
we might even be able to put another one. Nope, not quite. We could put advanced level 4 shields on here. So now I have a ship with only 350 shields instead of the, what, 1200 we had before. But now it has 70% armor reduction once you get under it. So once you get through the shields, the armor's pretty strong. So that's how you can decide how do you want to set this up? Do you want to be going shield heavy? Maybe that's really valuable against an enemy that is going, like I actually am going pretty heavy on Gauss cannons. I don't have any energy weapons really. I have put a few of these sort of ion disruptors on some of my ships to help get through enemy shields in case they go too heavy shields on me. But that's all I've done. I haven't gotten really deep into, I've ignored the whole lasers. And then the last slot is this A slot. I don't remember what A even stands for. Um, it's not afterburners. It's like this alternate slot or, or something to that effect. Uh, and you can put various specialty things here. Like you can research regenerative hull tissue, which allows you to continue moving your fleet around and not having to send it back for repairs because it repairs itself. Oh, nice. Or you could put afterburners, which could be valuable to put on your battleships so that it increases their combat speed to catch up with the rest of the fleet. Pretty valuable. Mm. So that is how you build your fleet. And that's how you would do all of these uh, various options here. Any other questions about this system before we move on? No, it's just the, the only thing I can understand that right now is that the computer is in con complete control of the speed of how each ship goes in, the weapons it decides to shoot, yep. et cetera, just like et EU4, it's going to make the best, most intelligent decisions that it can, and there are going to be mm -hmm. dice rolls involved, I think. Actually, no, actually, yeah. there might be mostly determined. Well, there are dice rolls involved in whether or not your missiles get shot down by point defense. There are percentage chances of whether or not your uh, accuracy will hit or not. But as a general, those things are going to average out over the course of a battle. I feel like EU4, you can get screwed by the, you know, 10 or so dice rolls that are involved in a battle. Maybe if 70% of them go against you pretty badly, it can hurt. Whereas this has like dozens and dozens of ships all rolling dice at the same time. It's going to average out. Over the course of a right, battle. right, it's going to have a law of probability just having the so it's, 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 there. it can yeah, be right. effectively, effectively, it's deterministic. Um, yeah. Now, it's also worth pointing out that all of these things, the more advanced versions you stick on your ship, the higher the cost. Because if we look at, for example, a zero point reactor, level five small one costs twenty five minerals, whereas a basic one costs only five. Oh, right. So as you build, as you can design more advanced ships, you're going to need to pay higher amounts of minerals, excuse me, to build them. So All right. that is worth keeping in but mind. But you're not well. hurting for minerals in this game. Are in you? this game, 14, I am not 000. hurting for minerals, no. <laughs> uh, in addition, once you've changed a design, if you select a fleet, this button here will allow you to upgrade it. And this works just like upgrading your navy in EU4. They'll right, go to the closest right. port and they will upgrade. And that can mm -hmm. be very valuable, uh, especially if you are just before another battle breaks out and you're like, oh crap, I haven't redesigned anything in a while. Uh, then, then that's pretty useful. Now there is an auto upgrade button here. What this does is if you ignore your ship design, which you could certainly do. Some people don't like doing all this nonsense. It's just tedious work to them, uh, and that's fine. You can set up a basic ship plan, like I want Gauss cannons, I want missiles, and I want this, and you'll start with level one of these or whatever, and level one of these down here. And if you tick auto upgrade, then as long as there is power available, it will automatically move to the next highest uh, tech as long as, as, as it becomes available from your research, which means as soon as you get uh, a better power plant, it'll upgrade your ship with a better power plant. If that gives you enough power to upgrade another piece, like a weapon system, to a new technology that you've researched, it'll upgrade that too. Uh, so it'll do that all in the background automatically as you unlock things. It's So slightly, do you like to do that yourself, or do you do I this don't, auto? I don't, like? I don't do the auto upgrade because it's slightly less efficient, uh, right. because it'll wait to put a new gun on your ship until you have enough power, whereas I might say, well, I'd rather sacrifice a shield slot to get a better gun on the ship. Or right, I'll put like the that. gun in there and make a, like a battle cruiser hood type design or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. Right. So okay. that is how you would upgrade your ships. Now, upgrading your ships does cost minerals, and it's usually the mineral, I think it would be the difference between the two designs, maybe, I'm not sure, but it's usually a, a small amount. It's not as much as constructing a brand new fleet, obviously. Uh, you get a break there. Um, and I think 
that about covers it. Everything we're going to talk about today with regards to ship designs and stuff. Maybe we'll do another one in the near future with regards to uh, conquering systems and war, because that is a little bit different from EU4 and the other games. And if you've never played those, it's definitely valuable. The only last parting usefulness I will leave with you is this. Yes. All right. Wow. Look at that. We never. Oh, yeah. This is the Roman Republic uh, in this game. Uh, I have expanded quite a bit, but uh, I have been blocked in by my neighbors, and I will show you how... <laughs> is this the Shard series? This here? is my Shards of the Star series. Now, I mean, yes. in the bottom right uh, corner here, we have a bunch of options. Uh, this button will turn on and off sectors. I like leaving mm. it on, personally. Uh, but uh, there are other buttons here. Go to... This is like the... I believe uh, this will go to your home... Or whatever your home system is located. Yep. This is a search button, just like in... EU4, or Hearts of Iron, you can type in uh, Alpha Centauri and find it and click and it'll take you there. So if you see something mentioned in a thing but you can't oh, figure out... Would you out use the F key? Is that the what F you key did? or, or the find? button in the bottom right corner. F key. Uh, right, yeah, it's like EU4. Then yep. That's smart. Uh, multiplayer okay. chat. The help button here will unlock the wiki. <laughs> unlock. Ah. It'll load the wiki. The wiki's pretty valuable. <laughs> unlock the wiki. Um, well, I wish EU4. Does EU4 have that? I don't think so. It doesn't have it in-game. I just use it open. I no. usually keep it open on a secondary monitor. Uh, you might just right. tab out for it. But the important piece before we leave is these diplomatic map mode, the opinion map mode, the AI attitude map mode. All ah. of those are like the map modes in EU4. The diplomatic map mode is important because if you notice in this game, I have no relationships with anyone except that I have, these guys have closed their borders to me. Oh, that's nice. So you're just really well loved out there. Uh, those no, roads. no. I'm actually <laughs> detested. This is the opinion detested, map mode. Exactly. As we uh, click out. These guys are minus 700, minus Ooh. 700, minus uh, oops, uh, 700. Uh, yeah, minus 400. And it's because I committed genocide. But in my defense, it was genocide of these cro cockroach looking guys who wanted to purify the galaxy. These guys were genocidal maniacs. I was doing everyone a favor, all right? A counter-genocide. It was a counter-genocide, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so if you want to learn more about this game, the Shards of the Stars series is a great place to go for that on my channel. Uh, yes, I will, I've will. i seen the first. I need to watch some more. That's and right. uh, the point here is that you can use the diplomatic map mode to see that the people around me all have defensive packs. I'm hovering over to determine what the green means, and it says has defensive packed with. Oh, green means has a defensive alliance. So everyone around me has a defensive alliance against me, basically, <laughs> because of that early uh, expansion. So yeah, that happened. Oh yeah, that looks like the entire galaxy there. And That's these guys cool. over here have closed their borders to these guys over here, because you, you click on the, the place you want to see, and that's who you're seeing there uh, sort of um, their view from. So that'll wrap Can it up. You, yep, all right. Thank you, Mark. We look forward to putting together an interesting war-based option in the future. There's also more to talk about with regards to federations and special federation fleets and how you can utilize those to your advantage. But for now, mm. this is Bridger signing off. Have Thanks so much.